A few years ago, if we talked about where you should or shouldn't be in the event of World War III, you might not have taken it very seriously. But in 2023, global war doesn't seem all that inconceivable. So who knows, in a few months you could be thinking about buying a plane ticket out of your soon-to-be-smashed country. Listen carefully, this is where you don't want to be when it all kicks off. Number 15. We first need to set the scene for World War III to show you how realistic the possibility of it happening is. So, in the number 15 spot, we'll put the world in general. After all, World War III will affect just about every person in the world due to various disruptions. The week we started researching information for this video, the news media told us that the USA and its allies plan to provide F-16 fighter jets to Ukraine, whose position in the wrecked city of Bakhmut was also the focus of the global media that same week. Ukraine President Volodymyr Zelensky denied that Bakhmut was lost. Still, there was no doubt Russia was very close to completely occupying the city. Zelensky compared Bakhmut to the Japanese city of Hiroshima, which as you know, along with Nagasaki, was hit with an American-made atom bomb at the end of World War II. When Zelensky said those words, he was attending the G7 summit actually in Hiroshima, where he cozied up to the G7 nations, Canada, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, the UK, and the US. Countries you'll hear more about later. The group discussed China's militarization activities in the Asia-Pacific region, to which China said it had been smeared by nations interfering in China's internal affairs. It was a busy week. As China dusted itself off from the verbal bashing, the Russian Foreign Minister Alexander Grushko talked about how that F-16 plan was all part of the West's escalation scenario. He said this route means colossal risks, and Russia would still achieve its aims in Ukraine anyway. Meanwhile, political scientists have talked about the global balance of power, and some say that the so-called unipolarity in the world, with the US as the sole superpower, the hegemon, is under threat as China and Russia seek to usher in a multipolar world, the way it was for centuries. Some theorists have said if the powers cannot reduce these tensions by embracing a new politics of detente, we'll walk into World War III and it will be world-crushing. Many pundits have seriously talked about an escalation in Ukraine. They say Russia and Ukraine cannot win outright, and if Russia feels threatened to close its borders, its tactical nuclear weapons might be pulled out. If this happens, the escalation train will scream choo-choo through clouds of thick, rancid nuclear fallout. As the Open Democracy Network said in April, most Kremlin watchers take the view that losing Crimea would be a defeat too far for Putin, and the risk of it could push Russia into a direct threat to go nuclear. National security experts, former diplomats, and military bigwigs in the US belonging to the Eisenhower Media Network co-signed an open letter in May, stating future devastation could be exponentially greater as nuclear powers creep ever closer toward open war. They called Ukraine a new era of confrontation and slaughter that may well be our undoing. This is serious. If Russia uses tactical nuclear weapons, NATO will almost certainly respond, and if that happens, a global nuclear war is possible. Ok, so that's the setting for this show. Sure, it's one of our fictional disaster scenarios, but this is not a show about zombies or mega tsunamis. It's much more real than that. We aren't kidding around today. In this reality, we expect there to be two sides. The obvious one is the US and NATO, with China and Russia making up the lodestone of the enemy forces. Japan, India, Taiwan, Israel, Australia, and South Korea are on the side of NATO. Iran, Syria, possibly Pakistan, Belarus, and North Korea are on the side of Russia and China. It's hard to predict where all countries would get involved and where their alliances would stand if their regions became theaters of war. A lot of nations would want to stay neutral. Countries in South and Southeast Asia, South America, and Africa might indeed want no part of this Western war. It's hard to predict what will happen since a global war, as we'll show you today, will affect every nation. This is why we put everywhere at the number 15 spot. Whether it's nuclear fallout, inability to import essential goods, or not getting much needed aid, you won't have to be invaded or directly hit with bombs to feel the presence of war on your doorstep. Nonetheless, some countries are going to get smacked in the face with either a hard right or a left uppercut or worse, they're going to get their head completely knocked off. Number 14. Some countries wouldn't really have much of a chance in terms of fighting back in the event of World War III. They don't have large militaries or weapons of immense destruction to stage much of a fight. Such nations include Pacific Island nations, divided into Melanesia, Micronesia, and Polynesia. These islands have been and still are of great strategic importance in terms of security and defense. The Pacific Islands have been the focus of China for about a decade now, with many of these little nations receiving aid and means of development from China. In 2022, the Solomon Islands signed a controversial security pact with China, 
The US also has tried to cement relations with some of these nations, as has Australia. The war might not reach Australia and New Zealand, but it will reach the Pacific Islands. Everyone will want a military foothold in the Pacific. We don't know how it'll play out, but it might mean countries being swallowed up by their occupiers. They certainly won't be safe in World War III as they weren't in World War II. Number 13. As we said, a lot of countries will be indirectly affected by the war and many of them will be in Africa. On this continent, China has spent billions of dollars on infrastructure projects. Sudan, Algeria, Nigeria, and Egypt all have close military ties with China. It's hard to say if war will break out between pro-China and pro-US nations in Africa, but if it did, the pro-China side would likely be bigger. Africa is a big place with 54 countries. It's hard to understand where alliances lie, but numerous polls as of late have shown a preference for China over the West. The continent is starting to rely on China more than it does on the West. In 2023, it was reported that South Africa held a joint military exercise with China and Russia. China wants to establish more naval power in the Indian Ocean. It's pushing its navy out there already, with ships located in various areas to combat piracy. But it might be about more than that. China wants a military presence in the region to protect its position in natural resource-rich Africa. Many African nations have given their support to China's claim on Taiwan. In 2022, the Chinese foreign minister said, China-Africa relations are the bedrock of China's foreign policy. China has a lot of friends in Africa, many of whom have voiced concern and criticism about the US's role in the Ukraine war. One thing you have to understand is that some African countries already have profound humanitarian crises. We can't mention them all because that would take up the entire show, but we'll still say that this is a major factor for why the African continent will be hit hard by a potential World War III. In 2022, it was reported that in the Central African Republic, around 3.1 million people were in need of humanitarian aid, while in Angola, 3.8 million people didn't have enough food to eat. In Niger, 4.4 million live with food insecurity, and in Burundi, 50% of kids under 5 are said to be malnourished. The indirect effect of a world war would be devastating for these already impoverished countries, many of whom might have had to take a side. The war so far in Ukraine has made matters so much worse. Hundreds of millions of people in Africa have been displaced, with many of the poorest seeking refuge in neighboring African countries, their lives hanging by a thread. So can you imagine how they fare if the world erupted into full-scale war? Still, there's no chance they'll be getting nuclear bombs dropped on them, and they're a long way from nuclear fallout. Number 12. Like some African nations, already unstable nations will also suffer indirectly through worsening humanitarian crises. One of these countries is Afghanistan, which according to humanitarian organizations in 2023, was at very real risk of systemic collapse and human catastrophe. Afghanistan's population is about 40 million people, and it's reported that 28.3 million of them currently need humanitarian assistance. The country is suffering, even though it's already receiving hundreds of millions in humanitarian assistance. A spokesperson for the UN in the country said in 2023 that the fate of the entire generation of Afghans is at stake. If there's a World War III, the country will be on the brink of collapse, and the war will very likely push it over the edge. We're not sure if the billions it receives in aid from all over the world, including China and the US, will be there any longer. This might not seem important to you, but it could mean millions of deaths. It is important. The same goes for Yemen, where American weapons, intelligence, and training have helped Saudi Arabia to destroy infrastructure and civilian life. The UK and France can also take a bow for creating this river of blood in Yemen. We won't go into all the details, but millions of innocent people have been displaced. At the same time, in 2023, it was reported that 23.4 million people would need humanitarian aid, while 17.4 million are looking at acute food insecurity. There has been lots of humanitarian assistance, but again, World War III would put an end to that. As a result, many would die. Syria is also struggling, with reports now saying that things have become much worse in this country after Russia invaded Ukraine. It said 65% of the people in Syria now face food insecurity. 3 million people have been displaced in a country that has only just over 18 million people. The EU has managed to put together a 27.4 billion euro package to support the Syrians who most need it. But if the Ukraine war so far can do this much damage, what will happen when World War III comes around? And then you have Venezuela, which is also facing a humanitarian crisis and is in dire need of aid. South America might be one of the best places to be in World War III, but in Venezuela, it's said 90% of people now live in poverty, 
while close to 7 million have been forced to leave. A world war would make things so much worse. In many nations where life is already tough, more and more people would arm themselves. Chaos would reign as more arms made their way into criminals' hands. Society could collapse. It would take too long to go through all the vulnerable nations of the world and how not receiving aid would cripple them. These are just a few examples, but trust us, many, many nations not even remotely taking part in World War III would see large parts of their population suffer and possibly starve. This would not just be a war about weapons. The explosions where the battles take place would ripple out like a giant lake of fire, engulfing the poorest parts of the planet. But now, let's get down to business and talk about where the direct action would take place. Number 10. Israel, Iran, Saudi Arabia This one is tricky, so let's just say the region, already a bit unstable, could become much more unstable if World War III arrived. Israel is a very strong ally of the US, but also has very close ties to Russia, which is why it's maintained a hands-off approach in the Ukraine war. Iran and Israel get along about as well as Tom and Jerry, which could be problematic in a world war. Iran is certainly the US's enemy, Saudi Arabia has close ties with the US, you also have Iraq. Despite a war crimey US-UK-led invasion that killed hundreds of thousands of people, Iraq and the US are now strategic partners. Iran and Iraq also have fairly good relations right now. That doesn't mean things won't kick off in this embattled region. Israel already has nuclear weapons, although we don't know how many. Iran doesn't have them yet, but its program could be sped up when its good friend Russia is under attack in a global war. You also have to remember that Israel and Saudi Arabia rely on food imports about as much as any other nation. In 2020, Israeli media reported Israel is dangerously unprepared for global food shortages. Saudi Arabia would also struggle as global supply chains face disruption in World War III. Such chaos can lead to conflict. As for actual military involvement, though, it's very hard to say what would happen in the Middle East since US, Russia, and China relations are complicated there. Israel, we think, would feel quite insecure since Iran might take advantage of the situation as the US fights battles elsewhere. Still, many countries in the Middle East consider Ukraine a far-off war. As that war has raged on, the US has tried to isolate Russia in the Middle East and elsewhere, but has mostly failed. Russia has been busy making energy deals, building nuclear plants, conducting arms sales, and putting together summits in the Middle East. Countries such as Egypt and the UAE need Russia for trade. China and Saudi Arabia just completed a big oil deal, and journalists are now asking if China can replace the US in the Middle East. That is doubtful considering the US's security arrangements in the regions, but Russia still has potential allies in the region. The Middle East might want to stay out of World War III, but whether that's possible is another matter. This one's hard to call, but today we're not trying to speculate exactly what would happen in World War III, we just want to know where we would rather not be. We'd also prefer not to be in these next two countries if World War III kicked off. Number 9. India and Pakistan It's a hard call to say if they'd get involved in World War III, but you can't ignore the fact that these two nations are nuclear powers. They're under no obligation to fight, but having those weapons might mean something in World War III. These days, like many countries around the world, India doesn't want to look too friendly with the US in terms of opposition to China. It's certainly not taking an anti-China stance, and it hasn't joined the sanctions in Russia. Around 50% of India's arms imports from 2016 to 2020 came from Russia. India is a part of BRICS, what's sometimes called a rival to G7 countries. They are Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. While China's leader Xi Jinping visited Putin not long ago, he started talking about a new global order, a multipolar order, where the US is no longer the hegemon. India was mentioned as being part of the new order. In terms of Ukraine, Pakistan has, like India, remained neutral. So again, this is a difficult call. Neither India nor Pakistan has a dog in the Ukraine war. Then why aren't we saying we wouldn't want to be here when the big fight kicks off? Well, just because they are two nuclear powers, and in war, countries might not have the choice to remain neutral. India and Pakistan also have been at each other's throats for decades, ever since the British partition of India. It's unclear just how many warheads Pakistan has, but it's thought the number is close to 200. Some sources say less, some say slightly more. It's estimated the weapons range from 5 to 12 kilotons, although some of the country's longer-range ballistic missiles might be in the 40 kiloton range. Its F-16 combat aircraft and Mirage 3 and 5 aircraft can launch conventional and nuclear strikes. At the same time, it has nuclear-capable short- to medium-range ballistic missiles and has seen some recent developments in cruise missile capabilities. As of 2022, 
India operates eight different nuclear-capable systems, two of them are aircraft, four of them are land-based ballistic missiles, and two are sea-based ballistic missiles. Both countries are capable of causing extreme damage to each other. Again, it's hard to believe that they would go to war, but anything could happen in World War III. Who knows how trade will be upset, how economies will suffer, and how a disagreement could spin out of control. India and Pakistan might have to pick a side. And what if they end up on opposite sides? These two nations will not be a good place to be when the world decides to implode. But you can be sure these next two countries will be a worse place to live. Number 8. If World War III broke out, two places we would rather not be are North and South Korea. China is the Hermit Kingdom's biggest trading partner. If there were a global war, North Korea would be on the side of China and Russia. It would actively join in, perhaps using its weapons to attack the South and even the USA. In 2022, North Korea announced that it recognized the independence of the Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics in eastern Ukraine. The country has offered to help Russia in terms of manpower and also shells and rockets. When the UN condemned Russia's invasion of Ukraine at the start of the war, North Korea was one of the five nations that didn't sign the non-binding resolution of condemnation. The other countries were Russia, of course, Belarus, Syria, and Eritrea. In March 2023, North Korea boasted about its tactical nuclear weapons that could be fitted on short-range missiles and fired into South Korea. The country even simulated nuclear attacks on Seoul. We should add that we can't know if the country's nuclear capabilities are what it says they are, but who would want to second guess? North Korea's nuclear arsenal is a bit of a mystery, but tests have shown the country's nukes could certainly reach Japan and South Korea. The RAND Corporation projects that by 2027, North Korea will have stockpiled around 200 nuclear weapons, similar to the number that France and the UK have. Countries will discuss soon. We also know that North Korea has very powerful intercontinental ballistic missiles, which in theory could strike about as far as the US mainland. While the country is dirt poor, it has the world's fourth largest military and about 1.2 million personnel. It might also have a stock of highly dangerous chemical and biological weapons. If there's a world war, North Korea might soon swoop down into South Korea. Sure, the South would receive help, but that doesn't mean it'll be a safe place to live if hostilities kick off. The North, where so many people live in poverty and where infrastructure is plainly terrible, would also suffer tremendously. Again, we aren't going to guess how this would work out, but we'll just say we wouldn't want to be in either of these countries if the planet was eclipsed by war. Number 7. Neither would we want to be in Taiwan, which would very likely soon lose its independence after a successful Chinese attack. In the recent Pentagon leaks that told us Ukraine was struggling to get a spring offensive together, we also could see that US intelligence believes China would soon have air superiority over Taiwan in such an attack. Xi Jinping often boasts about the strength and modernization of the People's Liberation Army of China, which is said to be 14 times bigger than Taiwan's forces. Taiwan would struggle to hold off China, but anyway, in the event of World War III, it's just probably not where you want to be, even if it could hold off China. This next country would also struggle with China. Number 6. China and Japan have a long and complicated history. In the Second World War, Japan did things inside China that rivaled Hitler's atrocities in Europe. During China's so-called 100 Years of Humiliation, Japan surprised the European powers when it was victorious against China in the First Sino War. China had been the world superpower for centuries, and yet it failed to modernize its military, and slowly but surely its power waned during the era. Since that time, China said many times never again, hence it's updated its military and Japan can feel the heat. No surprise then that Japan is very friendly with the US and other Western powers right now. After World War II, Japan was reduced to a shadow of its former military prowess, but these days, its defense capabilities have been bolstered. The country also has very close ties with the US and Europe. In 2022, Japan signed defense agreements with the US, Australia, and the UK. These countries together condemned Russia. That year, Japan announced a huge increase in military spending, which will see its military strength vastly improving over the next decade. In fact, Western media outlets talked about Japan gearing up for war with China, what Bloomberg called a revolution in Japanese statecraft. The Japanese Prime Minister is not happy about China's activity in the Taiwan Strait. He recently warned that East Asia might end up looking like Ukraine in the near future. Such words could have been written by the US president's speechwriters. It's no surprise at all, given Japan's history with China, that the nation has thrown its sword into the ring with the West. Given what we've just said about North Korea, an attack by North Korea and China together would certainly cause a mess in Japan comparable to the mess the US caused almost 80 years ago. As you know, Japan's destruction involved a lot of intense bombing raids prior to the nukes, 
and it never backed down. Had those nukes not been dropped, Japan would very likely have fought off a land invasion with every last person throwing everything they had at the US. The devastation would have been absolutely terrible. It's estimated that there would have been between 1.7 to 4 million US casualties, anywhere from 400 to 800,000 US dead, and between 5 to 10 million Japanese deaths. What does that tell you about Japanese resilience? It wouldn't bow down to China in a new war, but China does have a much better military, and unlike Japan, it has nuclear weapons. So no, we wouldn't want to be in Japan for World War III. Number 5. What about the UK? A country that undoubtedly used to rule the waves when its empire literally stretched all over the world. This tiny island, three times smaller than Texas, could fit inside of 11 different US states. It used to be like an empire on steroids, bolstered by baked beans, strong tea, and fish finger buddies. No, we're kidding about that last part, but Britain does have quite an exceptional military history. Napoleon failed against the Brits, and the Nazis also failed, mainly because attacking Britain by land would have been an uphill task for any country. How things have changed. The UK is also a shadow of its former self where the military is concerned. It would be vulnerable in World War III, but it would have to go on the attack. Britain is the US's closest ally, even closer than Canada, that's right next door. The US's other closest allies are Germany, Japan, and South Korea. The UK has the smallest stock of nuclear warheads out of China, France, Russia, the UK, and the US. It's believed Britain could have about 260, of which maybe 120 are operationally ready for deployment on the UK's four Vanguard-class nuclear-powered ballistic missile subs. Only one of them is currently at sea, carrying 40 warheads. The UK calls this its continuous at-sea deterrent. Britain still has a very strong military even though the days of empire building are a distant dream. Even so, it's arguably a top five military behind India, China, Russia, and the US, at least according to global firepower. In a world war scenario, it would still be almost impossible to invade by land, but no one would try that. Russia, which we'll discuss very soon, has the largest nuclear arsenal in the world. It has at least 15 bases from where it could launch a nuclear strike at the UK. If you've picked up a British tabloid newspaper or looked online at tabloid news over the last few years, these fear-inducing media outlets would have told you that Putin has nuclear weapons that could cause giant 1,000-foot-high tsunamis to hit Britain, which would possibly create a nuclear holocaust on the island. You sometimes have to take the tabloids with a pinch of salt. But there is no doubt that they have a point about massive nuclear missiles launched from one of Russia's submarines being able to wreak havoc on such a small and densely populated nation. A strike on London with its 9 million people, a center of finance and culture, would be devastating. There are large industrial centers in the north, not too far from each other, some being Manchester, Liverpool, Leeds, and Sheffield. The nuclear fallout would quickly penetrate these cities. There aren't too many places you could go in Britain to escape from the doom. 46% of its food is imported, many people would go hungry. This is far from a self-sufficient nation. It would not fare well at all in a world war. But unlike these next nations, at least it's hard to invade. Number 4. Many other countries in Europe, those currently in the EU, are not as impregnable as Britain. France, one of those countries, is another nuclear power with around 300 nuclear warheads, most of which are submarine-launched ballistic missiles. It also has nuclear-capable cruise missiles for its fighter aircraft. France has four nuclear-powered ballistic missile submarines, as well as 40 Rafale BF-3 land-based aircraft and 10 Rafale MF-3s carrying nuclear warheads. France maintains a strict sufficiency policy, which means its nuclear weapons should only be used in extreme circumstances when its safety and security are threatened. But let's face it, if nuclear weapons really start to fly, we don't know how countries would react. Screw the policies, they might think, when they see noxious mushroom clouds hanging over cities like murderous mythological beasts. All countries have various policies about their nukes, but sometimes they are purposefully ambiguous. No one knows what'll happen if the world's nuclear powers went to war. The United States and Russia don't even have a no-first-use policy. Israel doesn't even admit to having nukes. As things stand, the nuclear world, you might say, is multipolar. When it was unipolar, the US thought about using them in China and later in Vietnam. Since other powers got them, we've had a stalemate. And once they start going off, mutually assured destruction will likely follow. While most of Europe supports Ukraine, different nations on the continent have thrown more or less effort into supporting Ukraine. The UK is obviously way more on the warpath than most other countries, but as we said, the UK usually does what the US wants it to do. France has much more independence, it's also bound by NATO's principles of collective defense, but we're not sure it would be as gung-ho about nuclear war as the US and the UK if Russia used nukes against Ukraine. 
it's hard to know how other European nations will feel about it and what they'll commit to and support. Germany, Poland, Estonia, and the Netherlands all have heavily supported Ukraine, and many other nations offer their support. In contrast, nations such as Slovakia, Bulgaria, and Hungary, all in NATO, have different, less caustic attitudes towards Russia. Some politicians in Europe see the Ukraine war as a proxy war between Russia and the US, with Ukraine caught in the middle, but if this war escalates, we still don't really know what'll happen. What we do know is that another controversial war across Europe would be much more devastating than the wars at the start of the 20th century, just because the weapons we have today are so much more powerful. World War III would also be a much more technological war, with hacking digital infrastructure playing a big role. We just don't think being in the middle of this small continent would be a good place to be. But neither would a few thousand miles to the west. Number 3. The US, far from Europe, next to a good friend in Canada and a less conventional buddy in Mexico, would not have a threat on its borders. If World War III happened, though, there would be chaos in the US. There's no doubt about that. It could take many forms, maybe even organized crime outfits in Mexico, well armed as they already are, would cause havoc. The US is such a polarized nation too, so who knows what'll happen internally if it all goes off and the nukes land in the US. The US has an anti-nuclear weapon defense system, the ground-based mid-course defense, which would take out nuclear missiles, although when you hear such a task has been called, like trying to hit a bullet with a bullet, it doesn't exactly instill much trust. If there was an all-out nuclear war, the US would get hit. There is absolutely no doubt about that. In 2022, the American Physical Society released a 54-page report saying US defenses wouldn't even be able to stop the nukes from North Korea, never mind China or Russia. The report added that the US's current capabilities are low and will likely continue to be low for the next 15 years. No one knows which cities would be hit first, but it's likely New York, Chicago, Houston, Los Angeles, San Francisco, or Washington DC would all be contenders. These cities are not ready for a nuclear attack, according to various experts. One professor recently told the press, there isn't a single jurisdiction in America that has anything approaching an adequate plan to deal with a nuclear detonation. Not long ago, a public service announcement was released by New York City officials, in which a lady explained that the big one had hit. Her advice was go inside, stay away from the windows, and have a wash. She added, don't forget to watch TV and go online to catch up with what's going down outside. It's such a pity the residents of Hiroshima and Nagasaki didn't have that kind of information at their fingertips just before they were vaporized. A large nuke hitting New York would kill a large part of the city's population immediately. It could bring down the Empire State Building, Madison Square Garden, Penn Central Railroad Station, the New York Public Library. The blast wave would bring down more buildings. A 1,000-foot fireball would rage through the streets. Buildings would collapse further out as the thermal pulse obliterated humans. Maybe 300,000 would die in the next few seconds. As the blast was spread, hundreds of thousands of more people would die. Many would cling to life, but with mild to severe radiation sickness. Many of those would die over the next few days or weeks, horrible agonizing deaths. Maybe a million would die, and a million would suffer their injuries. New York would be in pieces, so yes, we doubt following that advice by going inside, laying on the couch with a cup of coffee in your hand, while surfing TV channels would be of much use. You can't wash off a 150 kiloton nuclear explosion. It's not like spilling wine on your new shirt. Many analysts say Russia now beats the US in terms of its nuclear arsenal. We'll talk about that soon, but for now, let's just say the US would get hit and hit badly. Millions would die in attacks, but the nuclear fallout would get many more as chaos reigned in the attack cities and beyond. The weapon we used in our New York City scenario was 150 kilotons. It said Russia has nukes with yields of around 300 and 800 kilotons. The US has close to 5,400 nuclear warheads, with about 1,600 of them deployed. This includes 400 Minuteman III ICBMs and 450 operational launchers. These have a yield of between 170 to 335 kilotons. Numbers concerning deployed nukes, stockpiled nukes, and retired nukes are always changing. Just recently, a report said the US has 1,419 deployed nuclear warheads. The US would want to use them to prevent an attack on itself, so escalation would likely spin out of control very fast. The US's nuclear capabilities are diverse, with the country having 14 nuclear-capable Ohio-class Trident submarines, nine of which right now are in the Pacific, five in the Atlantic. The US also has 60 nuclear-capable heavy bombers, 20 B-2 bombers and 40 B-52s, as well as 240 UGM-133A Trident II D-5 submarine-launched ballistic missiles on 14 Ohio-class nuclear-powered ballistic missile submarines. It's said the US has 800 delivery systems or thereabouts, 
Recent reports say the country is spending $1 billion on a new nuclear missile that will be able to travel 6,000 miles, carrying a warhead with a yield of around 300 kilotons. The plan is to make 600 of them over the next few years, and like with all big military powers, the US will have a lot of firepower up its sleeves. If the country is hit with a nuclear weapon, we'll be looking at a possible nuclear holocaust on our planet. And all that talk you hear about the US turning its back on biological and chemical weapons, you can be sure is just that – talk. The US has always been a leader in this regard, even though it has often been keeping it top secret. It's a leader because it fears, rightly fears, China and Russia are developing their own horrifying biological and chemical weapons. The Cold War might have ended, but it's highly doubtful the biggest military powers have just given up research on such weapons. To be sure, the UN has said the United Nations is not aware of any biological weapons programs, but let's see what people say about that in 50 years. They will be horrified by the secret and nasty weapons the big powers are now developing, just as we're horrified about what the US and Soviet Union are doing decades ago. So, if the US were hit with a nuke, it would be, as the famous REM song says, the end of the world as we know it. But we would not feel fine. Number 2. As we told you, China will have its own secret biological weapons program, as will Russia. These two nations and the US would release biological and chemical hell. China also has nukes, maybe about 400 of them, although there's a lot of speculation about China's nukes. In 2023, Defense News reported, the US may no longer enjoy a numerical advantage against China in certain elements of its intercontinental ballistic missile program, according to Strategic Command, which oversees the US nuclear arsenal. It was said that China now has 300 intercontinental ballistic missiles and launchers, which is fewer than the US. However, the report noted that China's Dongfeng-41 missile can carry multiple warheads, so 300 missiles could get you slightly over 400 warheads. China also has short and medium range missiles, while China's in-class nuclear-powered ballistic missile submarines can carry up to 12 submarine-launched ballistic missiles. On top of this, there is China's H-6N nuclear-capable bomber. The country's nuclear capabilities are said to be growing at a fast rate too. Not to mention China's other military strengths. It might not be a country with much military experience, but in terms of manpower and equipment, it's certainly a force to be reckoned with. China's navy, according to various US sources, will soon outgrow the US navy. But today we're mostly talking about where we wouldn't want to be, and China is one of those countries. Like the US, it would almost be impossible to invade China by land successfully. The country is pretty much the same size as the US and just as diverse in terms of terrain. Some say even more diverse. It would be a nightmare to invade China by land. So the war would turn nuclear, millions upon millions of Chinese people packed into its largest cities would die, and the nuclear fallout, not to mention the chaos caused by infrastructure damage and disruptions in trade, would cause hell on the so-called Middle Kingdom. At the same time, all the countries that rely on Chinese trade would suffer. Just imagine our New York City scenario, but with many millions more people. Now for the last one, which is pretty obvious. Number 1. The nations that would suffer the most are Ukraine and Russia. We're putting these countries together because they are currently at war with each other. Ukraine has already been invaded, but if things escalate, Russia could easily be invaded by a NATO force consisting of the militaries of many powerful European nations and of course the US. Unlike China and the US, Russia would likely become occupied. But before that happened, the Americans would launch a nuclear attack. Much of Russia is barely inhabited, so the attacks would concentrate on Moscow, home to 10% of Russia's entire population, at about 13 million, 21.5 million residents in the metropolitan area. St. Petersburg has a population of about 5 million. Much of Russia is controlled in these centers. Even though it's much bigger than the US, there is less to aim for in terms of big cities. Russia has around 5,400 nuclear weapons, with around 1,644 of them deployed. In the 1960s, it detonated the biggest nuclear bomb ever made, the Tsar Bomba, which was said to be 50 megatons and damaged buildings as far away as 500 miles. The force of the explosion was 1,500 times bigger than that of the bomb that hit Hiroshima. It doesn't have one of those now, but it does have some terrifying weapons of mass destruction. Its RS-28 Sarmats, long-range ballistic missiles, can carry up to 10 large nuclear warheads and travel 11,000 miles, and they are a force of nature. In 2023, Russia said 50 new Satan II RS-28 Sarmat SSX-30s would soon be ready for combat. Russia might have about 1,600 warheads deployed at missile and bomber bases and on submarines. About 2,900 more are active, making Russia the biggest hitter in terms of nuclear weapons, and it has six missile fields. Dombrovsky, Kartale, Kozelsk, Taitysheva, Uzhur, 
and Alesk. Russia also has nuclear missile submarines patrolling the naval bases of Nerprichia, Yagilnaya, and Rabachi. Its nuclear bombers are stationed at Ukrainka and Engels air bases. Russia's cities might be destroyed, but its nukes would find their target. As we mentioned earlier, some of those are quite capable of killing hundreds of thousands or more people in just one strike. Though it's thought some of them have a yield of around 500 kilotons, though Russia might have some in the 1,000 kiloton range, which is quite insane. The country has about 1,900 tactical nukes, 1,185 intercontinental ballistic missiles, 800 sub-launch ballistic missiles, and 580 air-launched warheads from bombers. Again, the numbers change depending on the source because the exact number is guesswork. The first use of nukes would be in Ukraine, with smaller tactical nukes, possibly Russia's 9K720 Iskander missile system. These might not have the power of the bomb that hit Hiroshima, but these 5 kiloton bombs would still cause a lot of damage and would spread radiation poisoning and radioactive debris all over the place. Tens of thousands of citizens have already died in Ukraine, not to mention military casualties that have likely been underreported for both Ukraine and Russia. You can only imagine the devastation in Ukraine if nukes were used. The country has already lost thousands of buildings, bridges, roads, and houses, costing perhaps 300 to 500 billion dollars. You wouldn't want to be in Ukraine right now, never mind if the war becomes World War III, and when that happens, you can be sure Russia would immediately be hit back. So you really wouldn't want to be in Russia either, especially not in the populated areas in European Russia. These two nations would be ground zero of the war, but if things escalated from there, the countries we've already mentioned would also be places you certainly wouldn't want to be. A recent Princeton simulation study concluded that if Russia and NATO did get into a nuclear war, hitting the 30 most populated centers with 5 to 10 nukes would result in about 34 million deaths within 45 minutes. Possibly another 57 million would be injured, millions with possibly fatal injuries. Seems like a low estimate to us, but what is certain is tens or even hundreds of millions will die in the next year from their injuries, sickness, or due to nuclear fallout, and as we said earlier, disruptions to trade and aid. Russia's few population centers would take a hammering. But so would many of our historic cities. Conventional war would follow, which would look like something from a dystopian movie as militaries try to finish people off among the radioactive rubble, people who never wanted war and had no beef with each other. A nuclear winter is possible, which would mean the collapse of civilization as we know it, and a little ice age lasting thousands of years. Let's just hope World War III doesn't happen. In terms of the Earth's resume, when there is an intergalactic planetary meeting at the center of the universe in the future, having mutually assured destruction in 2023 written in the experience section won't be a good look. According to the New York Times, at least 108 million people have been killed in wars in the 20th century. The First World War started in Europe and lasted more than four years from 1914 to 1918, with 7 million civilians and 10 million military personnel losing their lives. The Second World War lasted for six years, from 1939 to 1945, with deaths ranging from 50 million to more than 80 million. Both of these wars were catastrophic, but could it happen again? That's what we'll find out in this episode of the Infographic Show, What Are the Chances of World War III? Wars can break out for a number of reasons. World War I arguably started when Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria was assassinated on June 28, 1914. This was the immediate cause, but there were a series of events which triggered the four-year-long war. And though there were a number of incidents that led to World War II, the European emergence of the conflict came about on September 1, 1939, when Germany invaded Poland, which led Britain and France to declare war on Hitler's Nazi state in retaliation. A third world war could come about through a US-Russia dispute, or possibly US-China. And of course, North Korea, which has been the hot topic in the press right now after President Trump's historic meeting with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. Hopefully that's made it less likely that a war with North Korea will happen anytime soon. A recent New York Post article featured the words of Russian President Vladimir Putin, who said, The understanding that a third world war could be the end of civilization should restrain us from taking extreme steps on the international arena that are highly dangerous for modern civilization. This was during his annual televised call-in show where he fields questions from the public. When you mention the words World War III, you can't help but think of nuclear weapons, as it's likely a third world war would be a nuclear one. Before we explore how a nuclear war might play out, let's first take a brief look back at the history of nuclear weapons development. The world's first nuclear weapons explosion was on July 16, 1945, in New Mexico, when the United States tested its first nuclear bomb. It was only three weeks later, on August 6, 1945, that the United States dropped an atomic bomb on the Japanese city of Hiroshima, 
It killed or wounded nearly 130,000 people, and three days later, the United States bombed Nagasaki, which killed 74,000 people and injured another 75,000. These two events marked the end of World War II, because this was back at the beginning of nuclear weapons development, and with only one side having nuclear capability, there was no retaliation. Following the Second World War, the United States, the Soviet Union, and Great Britain conducted more nuclear weapons tests, and in 1958, nearly 10,000 scientists presented to United Nations Secretary General Dag Hammarskjöld a petition that begged, we deem it imperative that immediate action be taken to effect an international agreement to stop testing of all nuclear weapons. Throughout the 1960s and 70s, as more development took place, treaties were signed to promote disarmament, but more and more countries developed nuclear weapons. Today they are believed to be around 16,300 nuclear weapons spread between 9 countries. They are the United States, Russia, the UK, France, China, North Korea, India, Pakistan, and Israel. Russia and the US share 93% of all nuclear warheads out there, but they have been asked to reduce the number of weapons under the START Treaty, which stands for Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty. All these weapons make the prospect of a third world war very different to the first and second world wars. So assuming World War III did kick off, and it was nuclear, what would it look like? HuffPost has launched HuffPost Apocalypse, a project that aims to investigate what an apocalypse would mean for humanity, and to support this, have been doing their own research and analysis into what the effects of a nuclear war might be. In a recent article, they proposed two scenarios. The first, a global nuclear war centered on a US and Russia conflict. In this scenario, at between 1,800 and 3,000 large warheads would be fired at nuclear weapon launch sites, ports, major industry command centers, power stations, and densely populated areas. The other potential area of tension that could spark a conflict is between India and Pakistan. This scenario would be on a much smaller scale, with around 100 smaller nuclear weapons being used out of stockpiles of around 200, with strikes on densely populated super cities such as Delhi and Karachi but it's possible that it could lead to a larger conflict with other countries becoming involved. What would the fallout be? When these bombs are dropped, there would be intense nuclear radiation and a blinding flash brighter than the sun, a fierce fireball, and a massive blast wave that would kill thousands. With so many casualties, aid organizations would be overwhelmed and unable to help all of the injured, meaning many would be left to fend for themselves with severe injuries including burns, broken bones, and deep cuts from flying debris. And the long-term results would be even more catastrophic. With so many fires burning, the skies would be filled with smoke clouds similar to a large volcanic eruption. These would block out the sun, which would cause the atmosphere and earth to cool, resulting in what's known as a nuclear winter. The latest climate models suggest that the use of a few tens to a hundred of the smaller nuclear weapons in the India-Pakistan scenario would cause severe frosts, drought, and famine, which would last up to 10 years and stretch across the entire northern hemisphere. In the bigger America-Russia scenario, there would be a long-lasting cold period with a global reach. It would go on for a decade or more and could be likened to a mini ice age. Talk of a third world war has been going on for years, much of the fear driven by the Cold War tensions between Russia and America which lasted from 1947 to 1991. These days there are still concerns that these two nations could come to blows, but the rise in power of China and also the nuclear development program in North Korea has meant new danger areas are present. Hour 1. In the Pacific, Chinese amphibious invasion forces stream out of civilian and military ports along the eastern Chinese coast. The massive fleet is a mix of military and civilian ships, including commercial ferries with reinforced ramps to allow them to on and offload heavy military vehicles. This first wave of invaders is 35,000 strong, and many more tens of thousands of soldiers are waiting for their turn to make the 100-mile journey to Taiwan. Chinese frigates scour the waters of the Taiwan Strait on the hunt for American or Taiwanese submarines. A formal declaration of war against Taiwan is being declared as the ships cut through the waves, and though no declaration of war against the United States is prepared, it's fully expected that the United States will honor its commitment to defend Taiwan from invasion. Any sub in the Taiwan Strait that doesn't belong to the People's Liberation Army Navy will be considered hostile and fired upon. A world away, Russian forces staging out of Belarus and the Western Military District launch an offensive into the Baltic countries. The featureless, flat plains of Eastern Europe are perfect tank country and favor the attacker, with few natural features to build defenses on. Overhead, a barrage of missiles preempts the crossing of Russian troops into NATO territory. Hundreds of ballistic and cruise missiles fly across Eastern Europe, aimed at NATO airfields, supply depots, and troop staging areas. 
Aegis Ashore facilities and other anti-missile defenses begin to light up the sky with their own counterfire. The average success rate of missile defense systems averages between 50 and 60 percent, but that still means over 100 missiles find their targets, cratering airfields, destroying fuel depots, and killing hundreds on the ground. But NATO hasn't been blind to the buildup of military troops by Russia, and the moment the first wave of missile strikes are detected and still in the air, NATO responds accordingly. The skies are so crowded with missiles for a few minutes that it's unsafe for NATO or Russia's combat air patrols to operate in the region, and they take to low altitude for safety. NATO's missiles have better precision than Russia's missiles, but Russian missile defenses are slightly more effective than NATO's. In the Pacific, China launches nearly 600 missiles in the span of an hour, the largest missile barrage in human history. These missiles target Taiwan's military and civilian airfields, hangars, command and control nodes, and electric power plants. However, a significant number of them also target American air bases in Guam, Japan, and South Korea. American and Taiwanese missile defenses put up a brave fight, but the overwhelming fire is too much, and many of the missiles find their marks. Guam is cratered by ballistic missile strikes, and America's largest military base in the Pacific is temporarily knocked out of commission. Thousands die on the ground. Further missile attacks target American naval vessels operating in the Pacific. China has needed four months to prepare its amphibious assault fleet, giving the world plenty of time to prepare for the coming war. The U.S. now operates four carrier groups in the Pacific, with a fifth in reserve along the American West Coast. As American satellites detect the start of the Chinese attack, a warning is sent across the entire American Pacific fleet. The carriers now move at full speed, taking random and aggressive turns, all in an attempt to throw off the targeting of China's missiles. American cyber and electronic warfare operations, however, are already underway. Targeting China's recon and targeting assets, they succeed in degrading the accuracy of China's missiles, but the sheer number of them still makes them a serious threat. As the missiles re-enter the atmosphere at several thousand miles an hour, American missile defenses put up a wall of lead and steel, with escort cruisers knocking out Chinese missiles with their own SM-3 missiles. When the smoke clears, one American carrier has been sunk, two have been seriously damaged, the third has suffered only minor damage. Many of the carrier group escorts, however, are severely damaged or sunk. The U.S. Navy has just experienced the largest single-day loss of life in its history. Hour 2 On the ground in Eastern Europe, Russian forces are making contact with the first line of NATO defenses. The NATO Rapid Response Force has dug in best as it can along the eastern flank of Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia. But the flat ground doesn't give much defensive advantage to NATO. NATO tanks are on the whole more modern and more capable than Russian tanks, thanks to crippling sanctions imposed on Russia after its annexation of Crimea in 2014 and additional sanctions in 2022 after its invasion of Ukraine. Other than destroying the Russian economy, the blockade of computer chips from major manufacturers such as Taiwan have been a devastating blow to a military already suffering from worn-out and poorly maintained equipment. This has had a cascading effect across the Russian military, as much of the smart tech of modern militaries relies heavily on computer components, which Russia is now forced to manufacture domestically. Everything from modern anti-tank missiles to air-to-air -air missiles and even fire control radar have a limited reserve supply and must be applied judiciously. The T-72 still makes the bulk of Russian forces, though in preparation for war several thousand Cold War-era tanks have been activated. These tanks suffer from serious deficiencies against modern weapons and are largely used as cannon fodder by the Russians. Scores of T-55s, T-62s, and T-64s smash into NATO defenses, soaking up anti-tank fire, while more modern T-72s, T-80s, and T-90s mop up exhausted defenders. Casualties are horrendous for the Russians, but they have plenty of outdated equipment to throw into the fight. NATO's tanks are far more capable than most Russian tanks, but they're also more expensive and significantly fewer in number. The United States is still in the process of shipping the bulk of its armored forces to Europe, but it'll be several weeks yet before significant amounts of American armor is ready for combat. For now, Europe must hold the line long enough for the U.S. to bring its full firepower into the fight, assisted, of course, by a few thousand advanced American forces stationed in Europe. Combat in the air is just as intense on the ground. Within minutes of the war's start, both sides' air forces took to the skies. Russian MiGs are capable aircraft, but again facing serious modernity problems from a lack of funding. However, while the Russian army has a reputation earned in Ukraine for poor tactics, communications, and performance, the Russian Air Force remains a competent and credible threat to NATO. Both sides are unable to bring the full power of their air forces to bear against each other. For NATO planes, the threat comes from Russia's numerous air defense batteries, which operate close to the front lines and can even threaten NATO planes from within Russia's borders. 
The S-400 system ranks among the best air defense systems in the world and is lethal to NATO's fourth and four and a half generation fighters. At immediate and close range, numerous self-propelled air defense guns shore up S-400 and older S-300 defenses. NATO, on the other hand, relies heavily on fighters and interceptors for air defense, whom themselves are at risk from Russian ground-based defenses. However, NATO enjoys one distinct advantage over Russia, the F-35 stealth fighter and America's fleet of F-22 air supremacy fighters. Unfortunately, only a few hundred F-35s are capable of combat operations across the NATO alliance, and most of these are from the United States. The vaunted F-22, the most capable air supremacy fighter in the world, is also in very low numbers, and most of them are being diverted to bases in the Pacific for sea and air war against China. Entire fleets of American aircraft are already making the Atlantic crossing with the aid of tanker planes, but it'll be a day or two yet before they're ready for combat ops. Europe's lack of stealth fighters means they can't safely operate near the front lines, temporarily giving the air advantage to Russia. Russia presses that advantage as best it can, but carrying out strike missions over the front lines is still hazardous business for its air force. Russian bombers devastate NATO defenses, but take casualties of their own. Long-range standoff attacks via air-launched cruise missiles keep Russian pilots out of harm's way. NATO responds with its own long-range strikes, but for now, the air over the front belongs to Russia. Attack helicopters from both sides fight ground defenses and each other all across the front. It'll take time yet for NATO to gather its forces, and the numbers advantage is once more in Russia's favor. Still, both sides suffer heavy losses of air cavalry to man portable air defense weapons and traditional air defenses both. As the second hour of World War III comes to a close, a massive offensive out of the military enclave of Kaliningrad pushes into NATO defenses in southern Lithuania. Further cruise and ballistic missile attacks rain out of Kaliningrad and into it from NATO return fire. The overwhelming amount of NATO firepower aimed at Kaliningrad quickly shuts down any hope of conducting air operations out of the enclave, but it's still a strong point of tens of thousands of Russian troops in armor who are manning defenses along the Polish border while a separate thrust north into Lithuania seeks to destroy NATO forces there. Russia's hope is to sever NATO from the Baltic countries, and there's little the alliance can do to prevent that at the moment. Hour 3 In the Pacific, the Chinese Navy has begun the bombardment of the Pengu Islands, silencing naval defenses there. The massive amphibious assault force has crossed most of the Taiwan Strait, and the island fortress nation is now in sight. Overhead, Chinese fighters battle Taiwan's rapidly diminishing air force for supremacy while other strike aircraft carry out SEAD operations, or suppression of enemy air defenses. Taiwan is equipped with very robust air defenses courtesy of America, and they take a heavy toll on the Chinese aircraft. China has over 2,000 combat aircraft, however, and is easily able to absorb the punishment. Lurking under the waves, though, the Chinese fleet runs into a coordinated Taiwanese and American ambush. U.S. and Taiwanese subs have been powered down, lurking silently and awaiting the fleet's approach, and now, with the lead ships in range, they begin to open up on the Chinese Navy. Each submarine acts independently, but with attacks coming from multiple directions, there's little the Chinese ships can do to avoid destruction. Chinese anti-submarine warfare aircraft have been patrolling the strait for hours now, but the Chinese Navy's anti-submarine warfare capabilities have serious deficiencies. Their biggest problem, though, is that they're up against American Virginia-class submarines and Taiwan's electric diesel boats, both extremely quiet. Multiple Chinese vessels are sunk or heavily damaged, and in the chaos, the invasion fleet spreads so as to avoid becoming an easy target. And that's when they run into hundreds of anti-ship mines deployed in advance by the Taiwanese Navy. The cost to the Chinese Navy is staggering, a satisfying payback for the losses the U.S. Navy suffered during China's ballistic missile barrage. But the sheer number of Chinese vessels means the invasion will carry on. Exposed by their attacks, the submarines make for a quick exit from the strait. They won't all make it, as Chinese destroyers and ASW aircraft score several hits. Hour 4 The air battle over Eastern Europe intensifies as both sides continue carrying SEAD operations against each other. For NATO, establishing air dominance is of critical importance as it's the best way to support outnumbered troops on the ground. Keeping NATO aircraft off the front is just as important for the Russian military to ensure the success of their ground forces. Without air superiority, the advantage is in the Russians' hands. Knowing that they couldn't guarantee the safety of strike aircraft against NATO's technologically advanced military, Russia has placed a focus on ground fire support platforms over air platforms. Russia's infantry is typically supported by far greater amounts of artillery than a comparable NATO unit, allowing them to bring far greater amounts of firepower to support their advance. In an environment currently lethal to strike aircraft, this gives Russia a sizable advantage at the front. 
However, this strategy also comes with serious limitations. Russia's forces are unable to exploit openings in the enemy's defenses for fear of outrunning their ground-based fire support and air defenses. As NATO forces reel from the Russian assault and fall back, NATO warplanes patiently wait for any Russian forces foolish enough to advance too quickly for their air defenses to protect. The Ukrainian war highlighted serious command and control issues for the Russian military, and while steps have been taken to correct the problem, Russian forces facing full-on electronic warfare from NATO and often out of contact with leadership for long periods of time occasionally move out of step with the rest of the advance. Those that do are immediately pounced on by NATO ground strike aircraft, who circle behind the front lines like hungry sharks. The bulk of the Russian force, however, maintains operational integrity and moves at a predetermined maximum advance rate so as to keep under the protection of their ground-based fire support and air defenses. This makes their advance slow and predictable though, a fact that the vastly outnumbered NATO forces take full advantage of. Heavily damaged NATO units are able to withdraw and avoid full destruction, allowing them to regroup and redeploy. However, NATO has its own issues. Russian electronic warfare capabilities are wreaking havoc on NATO communications, and the fact that the alliance speaks over two dozen different languages creates great difficulty coordinating the various components of the NATO Defense Force. English and French are the official languages of NATO, and most senior officers know one or both of them to ensure continuity of operations. But as communications are degraded and casualties mount, a lack of understanding makes it difficult for smaller units to operate together on the battlefield. The alliance is reeling from the onslaught and slowly but steadily losing ground. In the Pacific, American air power is yet to make an entry into the fight over Taiwan. Runways across South Korea, Japan, and even the Philippines face ongoing strikes from long-range Chinese missiles. The attacks have largely grounded air forces in the region, but they've come at a high cost by galvanizing Japan to join the fight. South Korea maintains neutrality, despite attacks on two U.S. bases in its country, and the death of some South Korean civilians and military personnel in the strikes. They are too preoccupied with a possible North Korean invasion instead. The Philippines remain similarly neutral, despite their defense pact with the United States. Wary of joining the U.S. against China, countries all across the South Pacific are delaying their decisions on which side to back, as confidence in a U.S. victory is shaken by the losses incurred by America in the opening hours of the conflict. There is growing doubt that the U.S. will be able to effectively fight off the Chinese assault, as China's navy and rocket forces keep U.S. forces at bay indefinitely. Backing the U.S. now could have disastrous consequences in a new world order in the Pacific led by China. Australia, however, is fully committed to its mutual defense pact with the U.S., and its forces prepare for deployment into the South Pacific. However, neither Japan nor Australia undertake any major air operations against China, instead ensuring territorial integrity and patrolling against any Chinese aerial incursion. Despite fears China would attack disputed Japanese islands though, there is no attack as the nation's focus is strictly on its pending invasion of Taiwan. Hour 5 Shore-based defenses rain hell on a swarm of Chinese amphibious assault vessels. The battle for Taiwan is on. China has decided to hit three different beaches simultaneously, two in the north and one in the south of the island. Because of the difficult undersea geography and suitability of the island's coast, there are only a few beaches where an amphibious assault is possible, and Taiwan has invested billions in their defense. Chinese forces first hit Gold Beach, the code word for a landing site outside of Taoyuan City. Shore-based batteries and mobile artillery open up on the approaching landing craft. Missiles streak into the sky, targeting the amphibious assault ships and their escorts over a dozen miles offshore. Landing craft and amphibious vehicles are being sunk by the dozens before the first finally makes it to the beach. By the time the first Chinese soldier steps foot on the Taiwanese mainland, 600 of his compatriots have already been killed or drowned. He doesn't fare much better, almost immediately getting gunned down by a hidden machine gun nest. A barrage of grenades destroys landing craft and all the men inside it. But there's many more landing craft coming. Gradually, the lead elements of the assault make successful landfall, but as the bulk of the assault force crosses an invisible line, the ocean suddenly erupts in flames. Hidden along the seafloor are long pipes through which the defenders pump raw oil. The oil floats to the surface before being set on fire, creating a raging inferno that floats along the top of the waves. The heat kills dozens of Chinese soldiers even from inside the protection of their landing crafts. Large fan-powered landing ships carrying armored vehicles catch on fire and begin to sink as their rubber skirts deflate. The losses are horrendous, but still the assault keeps coming. 
Overhead, Chinese strike aircraft do what they can to neutralize the island's defenders, wiping out artillery positions with precision-guided weapons. However, many of these planes don't survive their attack run, blown out of the sky by Taiwan's robust air defenses. But the Chinese military has more planes than Taiwan has air defenses, and inevitably air defense sites are destroyed one by one through a combination of missile strikes and bombing runs. Taiwan's best defenses are its mobile defenses, self-propelled artillery and short-range air defense batteries. These prove difficult to track and pin down and are a deadly threat to scout aircraft trying to sniff them out. Taiwan's own air force rises to the occasion, but it's hopelessly outnumbered. Regardless, the island's defenders continue to put aircraft into the sky, operating from highways as most airfields in the country have now been damaged or effectively shut down. A half hour after the assault on Gold Beach begins, the Chinese open a second front directly north of Taipei. This assault meets with equally intense resistance, and huge Type 72 landing ships with bellies full of tanks and infantry fighting vehicles race to the beach. The second assault forces Taiwan to split its reserves as it rushes to ensure the Chinese can't gain a foothold, but Chinese airstrikes are making it difficult to quickly move troops around. A volley of missiles fly out from the beach and smash into the lead Type 72, causing massive damage to the ship and sinking it. The wrecked ship, heavily laden with troops and equipment, sinks quickly in the shallow water, and a second landing ship runs straight into the wreck, tearing its hull open. It too will sink in less than a minute, creating an artificial barrier for the ships. Regardless, though, more ships continue the assault and, despite the withering fire, manage to make it to the beach. Ramps at their front open and the Chinese tanks and IFVs begin to pour out, to immediately be met by a flurry of American-made Javelin anti-tank missiles. Reactive armor on the Chinese tanks tries to deflect the incoming warheads but are largely unsuccessful against many of the most sophisticated tank-killing weapons in the world, and the US has provided thousands to Taiwan in anticipation of this invasion. A dozen miles away, Chinese air assault forces zip toward the coast in assault helicopters. To avoid air defenses, the pilots are flying at just above wave top height in a daredevil sprint to get past the beaches. The moment they near land, though, they're forced to pull up to clear trees and buildings, which makes them easy targets for shoulder fired air defense weapons. Numerous Chinese helicopters are blown out of the sky, but many make it to their destination. Public squares and large parking lots pre designated as air assault zones before the invasion. Chinese troops rush to secure defensive positions and coordinate. Their job is to seize key infrastructure across the invasion front and put pressure on the defenders' flanks. Taiwan counters with its mobile reserves, specifically kept out of fighting for just this reason. At several landing sites, Chinese troops are slaughtered as they're quickly overwhelmed, but the Chinese air assault manages to hold on to a few of its landing zones. The surviving assault helicopter fleet is already well on its way to the mainland and amphibious assault ships offshore to pick up more reinforcements. Taiwan holds the beaches, but under intense air attack, they'll be unable to fend off the Chinese troops for long. Hour 6 Somewhere deep behind Russian lines, a series of explosions lights up the early morning sky. Critical air defense radar immediately goes offline. More explosions 30 miles away eliminate a Russian command post. Flying at tens of thousands of feet over war-torn Eastern Europe, two American B-2s secretly forward deployed to Europe make their way back to friendly lines. They've flown a zigzag course to their targets, always presenting their stealthiest side to enemy radar. Russian radar technicians picked up an intermittent contact of something, but were unable to provide a firing solution to air defenses. On the way back to friendly lines, though, the B-2s are slightly more visible to ground and airborne radar, and several interceptors are vectored in on their approximate location. As they near the B-2s, their radar struggle to get a weapons quality lock, as the B-2s take evasive action and defeat enemy radar by angling away from it. Still, it's only a matter of time before Russian MiGs have sniffed out the general location of the bombers and closed in enough that no amount of stealth technology can prevent a good lock. Suddenly, the lead MiG picks up a missile lock warning. Instinctively, he dives his plane, picking up speed and hoping to confuse the incoming missile with ground clutter. There's more warnings across the fleet of incoming interceptors as the MiGs attempt to scramble. The dividing MiGs desperately try to outmaneuver or outrun the incoming missiles, but the short detection range spells doom for many of the pilots. One by one, MiGs are blown out of the sky, with a few surviving and backing off the vulnerable B-2s. Somewhere in the dawn sky, a formation of American F-35s wheels to cover the B-2s retreat. They are some of the few operational F-35s NATO has in service, and though deadly to Russian air defenses, are too few in number to significantly alter the air war. The B-2s must also be used judiciously, as they too are few in number to significantly damage Russia's ability to fight. Hour 24 It's been one day since the start of the Third World War. The Sino-Russian alliance has pushed NATO back significantly in the Baltic states as America rushes to recall troops on leave and prepare to embark reinforcements to Europe. 
it'll take weeks for the US to be ready for ground operations. Even with the world's largest logistical fleet preparing around-the-clock flights to Europe, NATO is rushing to marshal a response force in Poland as the Polish military reinforces its defenses on its border with Russia, held Ukraine, and Kaliningrad. After a day of fierce fighting, it's not expected that NATO will hold on to its Baltic allies for long, though that was always expected. NATO navies have initiated a sting of anti-submarine defenses that stretch from Greenland to Iceland and to the UK to help safeguard US troop ships as the first rushed reinforcements begin to load onto ships on the US east and Gulf coasts. In the Baltic Sea, fierce fighting between NATO ships and the Russian Navy has kept Russian naval firepower at bay. As it has so often found itself throughout history, Russia is unable to put its fleets to sea, outnumbered and outgunned by superior NATO navies. French and Spanish aircraft carriers have moved into the Mediterranean and are steaming toward the Black Sea where the Turkish Navy has been securing the Bosphorus Strait and cutting it off to Russian trade. From the Black Sea, NATO ships can harass Russia's southern flank with long-range missiles and airstrikes, though they still face stiff defenses based out of Crimea. In the Pacific, the US Navy and Air Force have yet to stage a counterattack against Chinese forces. Ongoing missile attacks have kept the US fleet far out at sea and out of range of launching their own attacks. Losses continue to mount as Chinese land-based missile strikes seek out American ships or sink and cripple them. However, the number of missiles in the Chinese inventory is rapidly diminishing. On Taiwan, the first two beach assaults have failed, leading China to cancel their assaults. Over 5,000 Chinese soldiers lie dead on or just off of Taiwan's northern beaches. Chinese air assaults have met with similar failures, but thanks to fierce air support, two of the landing sites remain in Chinese control. It's cost the Chinese Air Force dearly, though, with over 50 aircraft destroyed in the first day of fighting alone. Across the island, Chinese special forces inserted secretly onto the island prior to the invasion have struck out at Taiwanese political and military leadership. Several prominent politicians are either under arrest or dead. Efforts to evacuate senior Taiwanese leadership to the mainland, where they can be used for propaganda purposes, have ended in failure and Taiwan's president remains out of grasp with Chinese kill teams. Rather than allow Taiwan to recapture officials, Chinese special forces execute them. Hour 48 Tankers have been escorting US fighter and bomber aircraft across the Pacific nonstop for the last two days. The bulk of the US air forces now are stationed in civilian and military airfields across Japan, as the Japanese self-defense forces successfully fend off the worst of China's continued but diminished missile attacks Losses to U.S. aircraft on the ground remain significant, but enough aircraft are operational to begin offensive operations. The Chinese fleet has reinitiated amphibious assaults against Taiwan under the cover of a vicious air campaign. Most of Taiwan's air defenses have been neutralized by now, including the majority of the Taiwanese Air Force. However, as the assault commences, Chinese airborne radar detects a massive air assault of F-15 and F-18s, backed up with multiple tankers and EWACs for support. The F-18s have been launched from the surviving Pacific Fleet carriers and ferried to their destination with the support of drone tankers. The US Air Force's F-15s have been flying for hours from Japanese air bases, accompanied by their Japanese allies. The US and Japanese tanker fleet has remained in orbit around the seas south of Japan, topping off the massive air fleet and ready to help fuel-starved combatants return home. The largest air battle of modern war is about to begin. Chinese interceptors move to defend the amphibious assault from both the northern and eastern air assault. China's lack of aircraft carriers forces the fighters to remain close to Taiwan's shore, which exposes them to surviving air defense units, forcing the Chinese to turn on afterburners and try to meet the American and Japanese forces out at sea. There's another reason for trying to close the distance as rapidly as possible, and it becomes apparent as the first missile lock warnings ring out across the cockpits of Chinese fighters. Stealthy F-22s and F-35s are leading the assault, launching new generation long-range air-to-air missiles at the Chinese jets. The result is dramatic, as Chinese fighters are forced to dive to try to juke off the American missiles. With two missiles fired at each hostile, many Chinese fighters fail to shake off the missiles and are splashed. But stealth fighters have one inherent weakness. They have a very low missile capacity due to the need to carry all weapons internally. Spent even before making visual contact, the F-22s are forced to turn around, but the F-35s press the attack. Their data link capabilities allow them to guide non-stealthy fighter weapons to targets, while keeping the vulnerable fourth-generation fighters away from the enemy jets. Another wave of missiles scream across the sky guided by F-35s that the Chinese are having difficulty picking up on radar. But the Chinese have an improved air-to-air -air missile with a range in excess of 200 miles, and they launch their own volleys back at the Americans and Japanese. They can't target the F-35s yet, but the F-18s and F-15s give off massive radar returns and are easy prey for the improved Chinese missiles. 
Friendly aircraft tumble out of the sky as the Chinese press into visual range of the attack. The F-35s immediately break off. They're not built for close quarters combat. The F-15s and F-18s, however, are. Chinese J-10s, J-16s, and Su-30s are fine aircraft, but the F-15 Fighting Eagle has proven it is the superior machine in conflicts around the world. For every F-15 downed, four enemy aircraft are splashed. The battle is far from decisive, but American and Japanese strike aircraft are able to penetrate Chinese air cover and deliver devastating blows to the assembled Chinese fleet. Air defenses have a difficult time taking out the attacking aircraft thanks to their use of long-range standoff attack munitions. Missile defenses, however, do their best to fend off the attack and succeed with a kill rate of about 60%. But many Chinese ships are still struck and either sunk or rendered combat ineffective. By the end of the second day of fighting, America has finally struck back in an inconclusive air battle that saw both sides take steep losses. Its fleet of stealthy F-22s and F-35s, however, remains largely intact, but it's feared that there are simply too few to carry on the fight. Conspicuously, China's Chengdu J-20 has yet to make an appearance on the battlefield. Despite the setback in the air, China has managed to secure a beachhead on Taiwan. Now the unloading of the massive Chinese army can begin, but Taiwanese resistance is far from broken. Over in Europe, NATO forces in the Baltic states are exhausted and overwhelmed, with many surrendering to the Russians. It'll be a few days yet, but Russia is on the verge of reclaiming lost Soviet territories. However, the war is far from over, and NATO will quickly be capable of launching massive ground assaults against Russia starting with Kaliningrad. Hour 72 Fierce fighting rages on in the major cities of Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia, but NATO's 40,000-strong response force has been neutralized by Russian forces. The cost has been steep. But with conventional forces largely defeated in the Baltics, the massive Russian war machine begins to swing south towards Kaliningrad, which has been decimated by ongoing missile attacks. The battle for the heart of Europe will commence in days, as NATO uses Poland as a staging ground for its counterattack. In the Pacific, U.S. losses of ships and aircraft are steep, and additional material from the U.S.'s other global commands is being rushed to the Pacific. However, Chinese losses are even steeper. In a race of attrition, China will ultimately lose. Hence, it's vital that Taiwan be captured as quickly as possible. U.S. forces, however, have begun a naval blockade of China, cutting it off from its naval trade routes. Sensing an opportunity to seriously weaken its regional rival, India joins in the blockade, sealing China off from importing the oil and natural gas it desperately needs. Land supply routes to Russia are still available, but the steep drop in supply causes energy prices to skyrocket. Like Russia discovered in Ukraine, Taiwanese resistance to hostile invaders is stiff and deadly. Chinese troops are engaged in fierce street fighting, with civilian militias taking up arms provided by the government against the invaders. The Taiwanese people have no desire to be a part of Xi Jinping's China, and they make the People's Liberation Army pay dearly for every inch of Taiwan they take. Hour 168 Across Chinese social media, images of the ghastly cost of the Taiwan invasion are being spread. Taiwanese and American cyber warfare agents have managed to penetrate the Chinese Great Firewall, and now photos and videos of the devastation in Taiwan are being spread faster than Chinese censors can stop it. The Chinese people have for generations been told that a conquest of Taiwan would be easy and bloodless, but the high cost in terms of human lives is now clear for all of China to see. The Chinese Communist Party has used the state media apparatus to lie about casualty figures, reporting only a trickle of casualties each day, hoping to keep the public outrage down. Anger and outrage quickly builds. In Europe, NATO's second response force has engaged Russian forces across the length of the Polish border. Russian air defense batteries have been greatly attrited through ongoing strikes against them, but the cost has been high for the pilots of Europe's air forces. American stealth aircraft are badly needed in the Pacific, and the job of suppressing Russian air defenses falls on Europe's largely non-stealth air force. The outcome of World War III will be decided in Poland and Taiwan. Hour 336 Two weeks after the start of World War III, the momentum of the Russian war machine has begun to stall out in light of stiff and well-organized resistance by NATO forces. The invasion of Ukraine has proven that the much-feared Russian military juggernaut is a clumsy giant, defeated more by its own ineptitude than foreign military powers. While Western armies place a strong emphasis on logistics, Russian military forces have approximately 25% the logistics personnel of NATO militaries. This means massive convoys of Russian vehicles stuck on the side of roads and highways, starved of fuel and ammunition. Russian troops, especially its conscript forces, suffering from catastrophically low morale as they come under fire from advanced NATO weapon systems. Surrenders of entire units are growing increasingly common, and the high casualties are causing a massive political descent back home. Strong-handed police tactics against anti-war protesters can barely restrain the tide of malcontent sweeping across Russia. 
and Vladimir Putin's hold on power grows more tenuous by the day. While the Russian attack hasn't been repelled, it has been ground to a halt just inside Poland's borders. The arrival of a large American army unit on the continent marks the beginning of offensive operations for NATO, and the future looks grim for a Russian military suffering from bad equipment, low morale, and terrible logistics. The Russian Air Force, however, continues to perform well, though equipment and maintenance shortfalls have begun affecting it as well. Slowly but surely, European NATO forces have wrestled control of the skies away from Russia, and over the coming day, Russian frontline units will be exposed to the full wrath of NATO air support. In the Pacific, China has maintained its hold on the western half of Taiwan, but at a staggering cost. Over 15,000 Chinese troops are dead or wounded, but the Chinese Communist Party works hard to keep those figures hidden from an increasingly angry Chinese public. They were promised a swift victory over the tiny island, and that the United States could be defeated in the Pacific with China's advanced missiles and aircraft. Neither of these have proven true, and while the US has suffered massive losses of ships and planes, it's able to replenish losses faster than the Chinese Navy and Air Force. Taiwan's defenders have so far repelled China's attempts to push through the east of the island, and now American Marines are arriving in force. To the world's great surprise, US Marines are backed up by Japanese troops, who have revoked their pacifist constitution in the name of regional defense against an aggressive China. But it's not just the Japanese joining the US in defending Taiwan, as the Australians join America in defense of the Pacific. China alone in the region with no friends is now facing the monumental task of defeating three major powers simultaneously. As losses mount for the Sino-Russian alliance, both President Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin consider their final option. Nuclear power is the great equalizer, and the one way that Russia can overcome NATO's overmatch of its own military forces. But for every one strike that Russia or China may undertake, NATO will respond with two in an escalatory ladder that will end with the world in ashes. Russia's on the warpath and if successful in Ukraine is unlikely to stop there. Lithuania, with EU support, has shut off the flow of military and economic material to the Russian enclave of Kaliningrad, triggering a threat of invasion by Russia in retaliation. A world away, China flexes its muscles as it threatens the United States and their continued support for Taiwan. Fears of World War III are growing by the day, and the United States is taking them very, very seriously. Before we discuss how the US is preparing for the Third World War, first we need to know what its potential enemies are doing. China has long been preparing for a confrontation with the US as it seeks to become the world's dominant superpower. Currently, China falls short of the qualifications for a global superpower, qualifications which only the US fills at the moment. But with its dizzying economic and military growth, it might be less than a decade before the Chinese Communist Party can project power all over the world. China's preparations for a showdown with the West include dislodging the United States as the most important economic power in the world. It also has safeguards to its own economic interests in the wake of economic warfare versus the US. And to achieve this aim in 2013, it launched the Belt and Road Initiative. This massively ambitious plan included building new land and sea trade routes all over the world to connect China economically with nations all the way from Europe to Africa. To achieve this, the nation has not just invested in its own infrastructure, but in building trade infrastructure in other nations as well. However, China's partnership with host nations is more often than not extremely predatory. They offer economic loans to build massive projects that promise economic prosperity, like seaports and rail yards. However, the terms of those loans often dictate that Chinese companies must be hired to do the construction, leaving few jobs for locals. Interest rates on the debt traps is often so high that a poor third world nation is guaranteed to default. Included in the penalties for defaulting are clauses such as China owning exclusive rights to the infrastructure it builds for terms as long as a century. It is in effect a modern version of soft colonialism. China's plan is to have heavy influence in the trade of goods throughout Asia, the Middle East, and Africa, putting it in a very strong position to dictate geopolitics in its ever-growing sphere of influence. China's next preparation for war with the US includes securing its vulnerable trade routes through the South China Sea and the very valuable oil and natural gas deposits in the region, as well as the remaining rich fishing grounds. This effort began with the construction of artificial islands in 2013, which continued unopposed despite an international ruling by the World Court in The Hague that such island building and claims to economic exclusion zones around them were illegal. Foreign pressure also failed to stop China from stealing claims to oil supplies by neighbors such as Vietnam, or of using its Coast Guard to bully and intimidate the merchant and fishing fleets of other nations out of their own territorial waters. These islands have now become heavily fortified military installations, which include modern missile defenses, runways long enough for long-range attack aircraft, 
and an ever-growing network of surveillance assets, all geared for one purpose – detect, track, and destroy the U.S. Navy. Further preparations have included the addition of dozens of new ships to the People's Liberation Navy, which is now officially the largest in the world. Recently, China's second aircraft carrier came online, and in a few years will be ready for battle, greatly enhancing the CCP's reach in all the important sea and air domains. With Russia's increased belligerence in Europe, there is a serious concern that the two nations might partner up in an attempt to turn the current US-led world order on its head. Despite China's increasing capabilities, it still does not have the power to defeat the US in a one-on-one -on -one confrontation, and it might hope to split the US attention by partnering with Russia, thus forcing America to choose fighting between China in the Pacific or Russia in Europe. For decades, the United States maintained a policy of fielding a powerful enough military to fight and win two simultaneous wars against near-peer adversaries. However, with China's rapid ascension, this has become officially impossible without bankrupting the US, and thus America has been forced to accept that it may only be able to defeat one near-peer adversary at a time. The question is, how was the US preparing to do that, given the increasing likelihood of China and Russia starting a third world war? First, the situation in the Pacific might seem dire with China's numerically superior navy, but the real measure of naval power is not the number of vessels, but in the number of battle force missiles. These are the number of missiles that both navies can bring to bear against each other. The US maintains around 10,000 missiles versus the PLAN's estimated 2,000. Though those numbers have changed and will continue to change as China fields larger vessels and both navies shift in composition. It's estimated that by 2030, China might have closed the gap in battle force missiles to two-thirds of US capabilities. The US's first line of defense against China is the place that's likely to be ground zero for World War III, Taiwan. The small island democracy broke away from the mainland after the nationalists were expelled by the communists in the aftermath of World War II. Since then, the former dictatorship has become a vibrant democracy that has refused to reunify and put themselves under control of the Chinese Communist Party. Securing Taiwan is not just important for the ever-intensifying global clash between authoritarianism and democracy, but also for very important political and economic reasons. Firstly, Taiwan produces around 50% of the world's semiconductors after US companies ceased production at home due to expense. Semiconductors are important for every single gadget in your life. The global economy quite literally runs on them and they've become as valuable as a commodity as gas and oil. China itself produces between 25 and 30 percent of the world's semiconductor supply. So if China were to take Taiwan, it would now be in control of three quarters of the global semiconductor supply. This would allow China to effectively shut down the economy of any nation that disagrees with it by simply barring the sale of semiconductors to it, giving China incredible power to further control global affairs and reducing the West's ability to oppose its authoritarianism. Taiwan is also politically important, as it makes up part of what's known as the First Island Chain. This is a chain of islands that extends from Japan to the Philippines and acts as a very physical barrier to the expansion of Chinese influence in the Pacific. If China were to take Taiwan, it would not just break this carefully orchestrated containment strategy, but allow China to effectively neuter Japan's ability to resist it. With aircraft and ships stationed off Taiwan, China could target Japan's lines of communication and trade routes that cross the Pacific and hem the nation in, forcing it into subservience under threat of economic starvation. If China takes Taiwan, the US commitments to defend the Philippines and Japan would be made much more difficult if not impossible. To defend Taiwan, the US has inked several deals, selling the nation advanced weapon systems ranging from fighter aircraft to air and missile defenses. US military advisors have worked closely with the Taiwanese counterparts for years to prepare the nation for invasion. Despite threats from China, the flow of US arms to Taiwan continues unabated, and recently US President Joe Biden publicly voiced for the first time an unacknowledged truth in American politics. The United States will come to the defense of Taiwan in case of invasion. This greatly angered China, and the White House press corps was quick to walk the statement back. But what seemed like a political guffaw was likely yet another bit of intrigue meant to further the American strategy of keeping China guessing as to how the US might react to an invasion. If China cannot accurately predict what America will do should it invade Taiwan, it serves to create confusion and doubt amongst Chinese leadership. Should China prepare its economy for a flurry of global sanctions like Russia received after its invasion of Ukraine? Or should China expect American F-18s to swarm the skies over Taiwan and sink their invasion fleet? Strategic ambiguity is a powerful tool, and political theater is an excellent method for creating it. But the US is not planning on fighting a war against China alone. 
To this end, it has helped increase the capabilities of allies such as Japan and most notably Australia, who recently signed a military cooperation pact between itself, the United States, and the United Kingdom. The pact will not just provide security cooperation between the countries, but also help arm Australia with a fleet of nuclear attack submarines. This is of grave concern to the Chinese, who recently attempted to charm Australia away from its relationship with the US, a tactic which ultimately failed. In 10 years' time, China might not have to face off just against the US and British submarines, but Australian submarines also, putting the People's Liberation Navy as well as its all-important sea trade routes at increased risk. China imports most of its oil and gas over its seaborne trade routes, and this is exactly what the US is preparing to target in case of war in order to strangle the Chinese economy. Recently, security meetings between Japan, India, the US, and Australia were revived after a pause during President Trump's term. The Quad, as it's informally known, aims to tackle global problems such as global warming, cybersecurity, and ensuring a free and open trade environment in the Pacific. This is a veiled implication of the Quad's discussions on how to best handle China's expansion in the South Pacific. Currently, the Quad has no military commitment to each other, but that might change in the future as President Joe Biden makes the South Pacific and confronting China an area of pressing concern for the US. India is the only nation in the Quad without a formal security agreement with the US, and it has historically refused to sign on to any security partnerships with any nation. However, that may soon change as tensions between India and China escalate, and it becomes clear that India is not able to win a war against the superior Chinese military on its own. Bringing India into the network of security alliances in the South Pacific would effectively hem China in on all sides, and more importantly put allied ships and planes directly in the path of China's trade routes through the Indian Ocean. But the United States is also taking very material steps to confronting China. War with China would be waged at sea and in the skies, with very little of any action between the People's Liberation Army and the US Army. This will be a war of ships and planes, not of tanks and artillery, and the US is preparing accordingly. In an attempt to prepare for a confrontation with China in the skies, the US has accelerated the procurement of F-35s and made getting squadrons of the fifth-generation fighter into operational status a top priority. However, both the Navy and the Air Force have expressed reservations about the F-35's current readiness, which has prompted both the services to supplement orders of F-35s with orders of upgraded legacy aircraft, such as the F-15 Eagle for the US Air Force and the F-18 Super Hornet for the US Navy. To counter the threat of Chinese missiles, including its very vast arsenal of ballistic missiles capable of targeting US ships far out at sea, the Navy has also begun to expand the number of Aegis-equipped vessels in its fleet. Starting in 2015, the Navy also began to work on undoing the strategy of carrier-based sea dominance that it's employed since the end of the Cold War. With the fall of the Soviet Union, the US Navy enjoyed unmatched superiority and complete freedom of action anywhere in the world, and thus surface fleets were retasked with simply protecting carriers. Anti-submarine warfare and anti-surface warfare skills had atrophied as naval strategy centered completely around the big carriers. Now the US Navy is preparing its crews to once again face off against near-peer foes in ship-to-ship -ship battles. Submarines are America's second greatest naval asset after aircraft carriers, and yet remain nearly completely forgotten by most of the world, which is exactly how they like it. Currently, the US has a fleet of 68 submarines and is replacing the Cold War Los Angeles-class fast attack submarines with the new Virginia class. Investment in submarines has stalled recently and procurement plans are behind schedule, but the United States retains a significant advantage in undersea combat, despite China having a larger force of less advanced submarines. The realm of hypersonic missiles has received a great deal of attention ever since it was announced that the US was lagging behind both Russia and China in their development. Yet there's some misinformation and confusion regarding this technology that's made Russia and China seem as if they hold a significant advantage over the US in this realm when they really don't. Firstly, any ballistic missile is hypersonic, and China's recent test that saw a hypersonic missile fly around the world is not very impressive from a military point of view. Technically speaking, this simply doesn't add any additional capability that didn't already exist. The real threat from hypersonic missiles comes from maneuverable hypersonics. These are missiles that can not only fly at hypersonic speeds but can also maneuver while doing so, making them incredibly difficult to defend against. In this area, all three nations are still struggling to field fully operational missiles, but the US has made great strides in recent tests. One area where the US may in fact be coming up short is the development of advanced long-range air-to-air missiles. Recent photos of Chinese jets show that China has begun to field advanced beyond visual range missiles, while the US is still largely equipped with the AIM-120, an extremely capable and combat-proven air-to-air missile 
that nevertheless is only effective at medium ranges. However, the Pentagon's F-3R program aims to improve the capabilities of American air-to-air -air missiles by not just greatly expanding their range, but also improving efficiency in an electronically contested environment. A new generation of American missiles will feature two-way data links, GPS-enhanced inertial measurement units, an expanded no-escape envelope to increase lethality, and improved high-angle off-bore sight capability, allowing pilots to fire missiles without their plane being pointed directly at the enemy, thus lowering their vulnerability. However, the next step for US fighters is the AIM-260, which will feature beyond visual range capabilities and match longer-range opposition missiles while bringing the tried-and-true technologies of the AIM-120. But World War III will also likely involve action against Russia in Europe, as China and Russia are both likely to cooperate in such a scenario. This will be a partnership of opportunity, however, not of choice, as relations between the nations are difficult at best, and Russia grows increasingly frustrated at its status as the junior partner. With Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the Russian military has proven itself incompetent, corrupt, and inept at executing a modern 21st century war. Despite vastly superior firepower, the Russian offensive in Ukraine has all but stalled out. And this is with Russian forces facing a foe that has a fraction of the capabilities of the US military. Simply put, the only real threat Russia can bring to a global war scenario is their nuclear power. With the bulk of the US Army not taking part in operations in the Pacific, Russia would be easily contained by current US ground firepower, while NATO would be short on critical air assets. These are capability gaps easily filled in by NATO air forces. Four months ago, we would have spent an additional 10 minutes explaining to you how the US is preparing to counter Russia. Today, after seeing what the Russian military is capable of, we honestly don't have to. While victory would come at a cost, NATO would most likely win a resounding victory over the Russian armed forces. The only real threat Russia would pose would be in the first few weeks as the bulk of American firepower is being shipped across the Atlantic and prepared for battle. This leaves the Baltics and Poland vulnerable, but the deployment of NATO Rapid Response Forces would likely be enough to slow down an initial Russian offensive and greatly limit its gains until NATO's European partners can fully mobilize their own armies. US strategy to counter Russian aggression in the next world war is thus based around preparing European partners to better defend their own continent and not be so reliant on the US military, as the conflict against China will consume the bulk of US sea and air power. The Pacific is where the real war will play out, and after its stunning losses in Ukraine, it's unlikely Russia would willingly engage NATO in a third world war anyway. The unthinkable has happened and military forces clash on land, in the air, and on the sea, and underneath it, in the most violent war to date. But what would actually happen after World War III? The probability of a third world war is negligible but not impossible. All three of these big military powers who have the capability to launch a global war all have too much to lose by doing so. But history is full of examples of small conflicts spiraling completely out of control and beyond the plans of those who initiated them. To find out what the world would look like after World War III, we have to examine two different global wars, a conventional war and a nuclear war. One thing is for sure, the economic damage alone would reshape the face of the Earth. Such a war would inevitably begin by a confrontation between US and Chinese forces in the South or East China Sea. A Sino-US war isn't likely to go global and would require multiple escalatory steps to get there. First, China would have to directly threaten or attack Japanese forces, something that is predisposed to do already because of the presence of multiple US air bases in Japan. If China wanted to keep Japan out of the conflict, it would have to avoid striking these bases, which would have seriously detrimental effects on its ability to fight against the US. Next, a third party would have to be willing to exploit the situation to its own advantage. The most likely culprits here are India, Iran, and Russia. India would be tempted to act to push Chinese ground forces out of the contested northern border regions and perhaps even maneuver for itself to throw China out of Tibet, thus threatening Chinese freshwater supplies and granting it massive leverage over its rival. That's unlikely but not impossible, as a Sino-American war would largely be fought at the sea and in the air, leaving the People's Liberation Army free to fight against Indian incursion. Iran, however, is likely to exploit the diversion of US forces from the region for its own gain. A war between the US and China would inevitably cause a drawdown of US peacekeeping forces in other regions of the world. Currently, 60% of US firepower is in the Pacific. But as losses rapidly mount, the US will need to pull reinforcements from its multiple other global commands. With American forces no longer acting as police against bad actors, Iran could use the opportunity to attack Saudi Arabia and other Gulf states with its superior military. This would hugely disrupt global oil trade and have devastating financial repercussions across the world. Russia might seek to exploit US preoccupation with China for its own gain in Europe, 
While Russia has no ambition to rule all of Europe, it could see a drawdown of US forces in Europe as the opportunity to take by force breakaway Soviet republics and even some of its NATO neighbors such as Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia. In a worst-case scenario, all three flashpoints are ignited due to American preoccupation with China, leaving the world dramatically different after the war. Such a war is almost certain to end with a US victory over China, although an extremely costly and poorly defined victory. Immediately at war's end, the United States military would be severely depleted, going from the world's most powerful fighting force to a significantly weakened force that still has global reach but will take a decade or more to restore itself to its former glory. American naval and air losses would be staggering, as with much of half of its air and naval fleets destroyed. Half of the US aircraft carrier fleet would be sunk in a conflict with China, a loss of over $50 billion in ship costs alone, over 500 aircraft and over 12,000 seamen and aviators. The loss of all important American carriers alone would see the United States lose its ability to rapidly respond to global conflicts. This loss in capability would only be compounded by significant losses in the US Air Force. Without the ability to rapidly and overwhelmingly respond to global crises, the immediate post-war years would see an ignition of regional wars across Africa in the Middle East. Critics of US military presence around the world would rapidly see the cost of losing that peacekeeping force as simmering tensions suddenly explode in the absence of a threat of US involvement. In the Middle East, Iran would seize the opportunity to attack its longtime rival Saudi Arabia. Despite being an oil-rich and wealthy nation, Saudi Arabia is handily outclassed militarily by Iran, as it has relied on the United States to keep Iran in check for decades. No other power is likely to prevent Iranian aggression in the Middle East, nor do they have the capability to do so. All Europe European powers, save for France, simply no longer have the expeditionary capabilities to respond to military conflicts around the world without US support, and France lacks the assets needed to significantly counter Iranian aggression so far from its own shores. An oil-rich Iran would become a regional superpower, shaping the Middle Eastern policy to its own liking. This would inevitably lead to an explosion of extremism with waves of attacks against Europe and African nations, launching both continents into a dark age of terrorism. Enriched by Saudi Arabian wealth and oil fields, Fields, Iran could continue a campaign of conquest unchecked across the Middle East, forcing other neighboring nations into its fold and simply invading those that resisted. With its finger firmly on the oil tap to Europe, Iran would have great influence over European powers, likely leading to a necessary buildup of military forces in Europe and an inevitable invasion of the Middle East years later. A European Middle East war would be a world war in its own right, with staggering casualties on all sides and economically ruinous for both regions. Middle East turmoil would only make the lives of those in China worse. In the aftermath of a war against the US, the Chinese Navy and Air Force would be obliterated, with only those forces left in reserve in western China against India or Russian incursions left intact. Chinese infrastructure, at least along its eastern Pacific border, would also suffer moderate damage due to American long-range air attacks, while China can do little to militarily threaten the US homeland. Large-scale damage to Chinese port facilities would only exuberate the damage caused by years of American naval blockade. China relies on the Pacific for the majority of its trade, and most importantly for the import of energy resources. Despite heavy losses, the US Navy could still undertake an effective blockade of Chinese trade, crippling the nation and resulting in a GDP loss of as much as 35%. China in return could threaten US trade in the Pacific as well, but would be unable to directly threaten either the American West or East Coast, resulting in only an expected GDP loss of 10% for the US. But the disruption of trade in what's the world's most important trade superhighway would only result in the weakening of the East Asian economies and, to a smaller extent, the entire world. East Asian nations would be the hardest hit due to their dependence on Chinese goods. This will have a knock-on effect on European nations who import cheap goods manufactured in East Asia. The ensuing worldwide economic recession will lead to flare-ups in social unrest and widespread unemployment. This, combined with a worst-case scenario of Iranian aggression in the Middle East, could set the stage for revolutionary movements in some countries and the flare-up of partisan tensions spilling over into outright violence. Perhaps no nation would be as rocked, though, as China, who, despite inflicting incredible losses on the US military, would still be facing a humiliating defeat, with a near total loss of its navy and air force. American cyber warfare operations would work to steadily degrade the Chinese government's ability to censor information electronically throughout the nation, and increasing unrest and war weariness would embolden pro-democracy and separatist factions in China. While it's likely that the Chinese government would remain 
remain intact, this would represent a significant threat to the Chinese Communist Party, directly leading to even more violent crackdowns on an increasingly rebellious population. We've already seen this scenario in miniature thanks to the Hong Kong riots, and while China showed restraint in Hong Kong because of international pressure, it's unlikely to show restraint when faced with similar uprisings within the mainland when the survival of the CCP is threatened. The further disruption of the Chinese economy would have a domino effect on the rest of the world, especially those nations that rely on China for critical technology and imports. Global GDP would shrink significantly, leading to unemployment and unrest across the world. While the rest of the world is suffering, though, one nation might come out of a third world war smelling like roses. Russia has long suffered under a weakening economy, made worse by European sanctions due to its aggression in Crimea. However, the loss of Chinese trade routes throughout the war and a need by China to replace its destroyed military equipment would be a massive financial boon to the state. European powers might be even willing to lift sanctions against Russia and provide economic concessions or even political ones, such as allowing Russia to reabsorb former Soviet republics in exchange for the aid of the Russian military in fighting against Iranian aggression in the Middle East. A new global order after World War III would see Russia rising to a position of prominence it hasn't held since the days of the Soviet Union. But now let's look at a worst-case scenario, complete and total nuclear warfare that spans the face of the Earth. While a conventional World War III would still see the United States suffer the least militarily or economic harm, a nuclear war would almost completely level the playing field between China and the US, leaving both nations a ruined smoking wreck. The US still holds the advantage in number and sophistication of nuclear weapons, thus China would inevitably suffer far greater damage than the US. However, nearly every major US city would suffer at least one nuclear strike, with most coming under fire from multiple warheads. Should Russia join the fray, it would inevitably pull in nuclear NATO members such as France and Great Britain, and spread thermonuclear warfare across four of the world's seven continents. Previous fears of nuclear winter have since been proven to be overblown, but a global cooling effect will still take place, dropping global temperatures by a few degrees. A drop of just one degree centigrade in global temperatures would make Canadian wheat growing impossible, showing us just how vulnerable the global food supply really is. What farmland isn't rendered fallow by a drop in global temperatures would likely be unusable due to nuclear impacts. Both the US and Russia target each other's vast swaths of farmland as nuclear targets, with the express intent of starving each other into submission in case of nuclear war. With the US alone exporting much of the world's grain, it wouldn't just be the Americans that starved, but much of the world as well. Compound that with strikes against Russia and Chinese food-producing regions, plus contamination from other nuclear strikes, and hundreds of millions would begin to starve within weeks. The initial casualties would also be in the hundreds of millions, with hundreds of millions more falling prey to injuries and radiation sickness within days to weeks. Then, secondary effects of global nuclear war would lead to even more deaths, as trade routes are disrupted, infrastructure is rendered inoperable, and diseases caused by high concentration of airborne debris strike down people by the millions. Many nations around the world would rely on imports to feed their populations, and the loss of global trade alone would doom tens of millions to immediate starvation. As massive plumes of choking dust and debris spread across countrysides in Australia, North America, Europe, and Asia, respiratory disease would claim millions more. Global firestorms would decimate wildlands, as fires ignited by burning cities spread for hundreds of miles around, causing fires so fast that they'd be visible from space, if not for all the debris in the atmosphere. If one could peer through that thick haze of gray that would remain aloft for days or even weeks, they would see a planet in flames, with fires raging for weeks or even months and killing millions more. The world population would likely fall to below 1 billion within five years of global thermonuclear war. Within a decade of starvation, disease, and conflict for dwindling resources, humanity would be lucky to number in the 500 millions. However, there is good reason to think that humanity would not go extinct after all and could even bounce back in time. Most nuclear strikes are designed to maximize destruction. A ground burst of nuclear weapon severity limits its destructive range, as most of the energy in the explosion is sent down into the ground or absorbed by ground features such as buildings, hills, etc. Therefore, nuclear weapons are designed to explode over their target, greatly enhancing their lethality and avoiding ground clutter altogether. While this makes nuclear weapons more lethal, it has the positive side effect of sending more of the resulting radiation upwards and into space. Fears of a global, irradiated wasteland might be overblown. And while it's certain that radioactive debris would be in harmful levels just about anywhere on Earth, humanity and the livestock and food crops it depends 
on could still survive in sufficient numbers to eventually bounce back. That's because the fissile material in a bomb is destroyed in milliseconds, causing an intense burst of radioactivity that quickly falls off as atoms decay in a chain reaction. In several years, most radioactive fallout would turn into more stable elements, such as strontium-90. With its half-life of 29 years, strontium-90 and similar materials are still harmful but not nearly as radioactive as materials with a half-life of hours, minutes, or even seconds. As Nagasaki and Hiroshima have proven, it doesn't take long for humanity to reclaim the ruins of cities struck by nuclear weapons. The real danger is in the sheer number of weapons employed in a global nuclear war, and thus the higher concentration of less dangerous but still harmful, longer-lived radioactive isotopes in the water and soil. Human lifespans will be shortened dramatically, and many species will go extinct due to climate change, natural ecosystems will collapse, and a staggering amount of pollution will be created by the incineration of hundreds of major cities. Even after all of that, within centuries humanity should be well on the rebound. What shape the world would take, however, is completely unknown, though it's likely that none of the current major powers would continue to exist as cohesive states. In all likelihood, it would be Africa which would become the lotus of economic and military power, as it's least likely to be directly affected by nuclear war, and unlike the rest of the world, they'd still be able to feed most of their population, as many African states have agrarian-based economies. One thing is certain, the nations that launched World War III would not be much more than dust, and utterly inconsequential in the new era of human history to come. You're jolted awake by the sound of blaring sirens, and a daze you look around the dimly lit room. Through the curtains comes a blood-red glow. You slowly walk toward the window and pull back the curtains. An intense light from outside is blinding. You bring your arm up to your face to shield your eyes. As you squint to bring the world into focus, you see something looming in the distance. A mushroom cloud the size of a mountain rises from the ground. It's finally happened. World War III has begun and you most likely won't survive it. You run across the room and grab your cell phone. It's dead. The EMP blast from the nuke has wiped out all electronics and microchips in the surrounding area. You run to grab the survival kit you built based on one of your favorite infographic show videos. It has everything you need to survive a doomsday scenario. You take out the crank radio and you turn it. Over the static comes a crackling voice. The announcer confirms what you've been afraid of this whole time. The voice on the radio it fades in and out. You can only make out pieces of the announcement, but it's clear what's happening. The world has broken out into all-out war. This is nothing like past world wars with soldiers, tanks, and planes. No, this war is all about nukes, cyber hackers, and space. The voice on the radio relays which cities have been hit. It started with Washington DC, then Hong Kong. Retaliation from the Chinese took out Los Angeles, then the nukes were launched at Moscow. The Middle East in its plumes of fiery oil and gas. Mainland Europe is at war with Britain. Almost every major city in the world has been hit. Billions of lives have been lost instantly. But what about you and the others who were lucky enough to survive the initial blasts? Could you survive World War III? Probably not, but let's see what might be in store for you. As you prepare to leave your house and seek shelter in more rural areas, you hear the radio announcer trying to determine how the carnage started. It seems that no one's quite sure who launched first or who the aggressor was. Before World War III broke out, there were some ominous conflicts brewing. You hear a shuffling of papers as the broadcaster organizes his notes. He, like everyone else left on Earth, is trying to make sense of what's happening. The announcer begins his rundown of what sparked World War III and the end of the world as you know it. This all could have been avoided if the United States and Iran maintained diplomatic relations instead of blowing up each other's military assets, he says. Or maybe it all started with North Korea threatening the United States over and over again. Then someone with a happy trigger finger launched the first nuke. My best guess, continues the broadcaster, was that China had finally caught up to the military strength of the US and differences in ideology led to a conflict that may very well end up eradicating all of humanity. You grab your survival kit, thank you to the infographic show for helping you to prepare for a doomsday scenario, and you walk out of your house. Planes have fallen out of the sky and lay in fiery wrecks around your neighborhood. The EMP blasts from the nukes fried their controls and caused many to fall from the sky. You start walking down the street. You know the radiation from the nuclear explosion is enough to cause third degree burns even if you're miles away. Not to mention even small doses of radiation can cause mutations in your DNA which can lead to cancer and other diseases. Just by being within eyesight of the nuclear explosion of World War III means you might not survive. Then suddenly something enters the atmosphere causing a sonic boom. You look up and shield your eyes as a fireball careens toward the ground. The object smashes into your house, causing it to ignite in a fiery explosion. You run back to see what happened. Where your house once stood, there is now a large crater. On one of the metal shards that's sticking out of the earth, you see some writing. You kick the debris off to clear the dirt. The acronym NASA adorns the metal plate. 
The fireball that fell from the sky and destroyed your house was a satellite. This is a new type of warfare, you think, the warfare of space. You look up into the sky and see flashes of light beyond the atmosphere. World War III has gone beyond the terrestrial world and now includes the cosmos. Crewed rockets are launched to take control of the International Space Station. It's not a military asset per se, but it offers a strategic advantage. From the ISS, rockets and other spacecraft can be refueled. Satellites can be manipulated, and data using onboard sensors and cameras can be relayed to the military. World War III has now weaponized space. Outer space is not the only battleground that's not on the planet's surface. Hackers have turned cyberspace into a war zone as well. They've taken control of military assets on both sides of the war. These hackers might be working for the opposition or just for themselves. Either way, they've hacked into satellite guidance systems and military computers. And this war is not led just by the generals of the military, but by the tech geeks who command the world of code as well. World War III is a physical war and a cyber war. Since your coding skills are not up to par, you figure it's best to get away from populated areas and the technology that's associated with them. You never know when a hacker will take over one of the military's autonomous robots or drones and send it after you. There's no way I'm going to survive this, you think, as you head toward the city limits. As you run toward the tree line on the outskirts of town, you begin to cough. There's smoke coming out of the forest. What fresh hell is this, you think? You head for higher ground to survey the area that used to be a protected state park. You climb the ladder of a water tower and take out the binoculars from your survival kit. Where would I be without all the survival tips from the infographic show, you think? Probably already dead. From the water tower, you see that the forest is ablaze. Smoke pours out of the treetops and into the air. When the nuke went off, the residual heat ignited part of the forest, and now the uncontrollable blaze is burning away every tree in its path. This is all happening around the world. It's at this point you realize you are in big trouble. Yeah, you were in trouble before, but now you see what the future holds. Winter is coming. And it's not the Game of Thrones version. The winter that's coming for you is nuclear winter. There's no way you're going to make it through this alive. The weapon of choice for World War III is the nuke. Unfortunately for all of humanity, nuclear explosions have long-term effects that are more widespread than just the initial explosion. You leave the urban area that was once home and head for the rural lands away from any major hub of civilization. You figure that the safest place to be during World War III is where there is little technology and even fewer people. You find an abandoned coal mine that's been drilled into a mountain. The thick rock walls provide you some protection from radiation and keeps you shielded from the natural elements. Your new cave home keeps you alive for a little while longer, but how much longer will you be able to survive with nuclear winter on the horizon? As you step out of your cave in the middle of the afternoon, the first thing you notice is that it's dark. The smoke, soot, and debris that's been flung up into the atmosphere by the nuclear explosions is suspended in the air. The superheated air around where the bombs went off forced particles from the surface to rise. The debris in the atmosphere has blocked out the sun. Earth's temperature has begun to cool. You're in the early stages of nuclear winter. In the days that follow the beginning of World War III, soot and smoke from the smoldering remains of cities enters the atmosphere. The nuclear blasts melt everything from plastics to metal and release harmful chemicals into the air. This not only began blocking out the sun, but vast amount of carcinogens and other chemicals are swept across the planet by wind. No one's safe from the nuclear fallout. Next came the firestorms. The cities where nuclear devices exploded are on fire. The surrounding towns are on fire. The forests are on fire. These fires never get a chance to burn out before the wind sweeps them across the planet. In the United States, the fires in Los Angeles, San Francisco, and Seattle are swept across the Great Plains, causing the entire Midwest to burn. In Russia, even with its freezing temperatures, the forests are ablaze. Anything that could catch fire did catch fire. No one's safe from the flames of the nuclear holocaust. And with those flames, smoke and dust rise into the atmosphere, ensuring that sunlight won't shine on Earth for weeks. And after weeks of no sunlight, it starts to snow. It isn't white snow like you played in as a child, but black snow. What falls from the sky is all the soot and debris from the fires that are burning the planet. The charred black snow covers the ground. At least the sun's back, you think. Unfortunately, it's too late. The lack of sunlight has caused the Earth's temperature to drop and nuclear winter to begin. You lived through nuclear bombs exploding, you lived through fires engulfing the planet, you lived through black snow falling from the sky, but now that nuclear winter has started, you most certainly won't live to see the return of summer. The days go by and World War III is slowed down, not because there's a clear victor, but because everyone is a loser. The human species has lost. You are one of the few remaining individuals of a now endangered species. After the black snow begins to fall, the temperature declines by 30 degrees Fahrenheit. 
Killer frosts and sub-freezing temperatures wipe out much of the remaining plant and animal life on Earth. You struggle to find anything to eat and unpolluted water to drink. You subsist entirely off of old army rations you found at an abandoned military base. Even in the extremely cold temperature, your body burns from the inside. There's no escaping the radiation that was ejected into the air from the hundreds of nuclear explosions. Like you, plants and animals around the world are suffering from burns and harmful mutations caused by the radiation. Evolution cannot keep up with the rapidly cooling planet and changing environments. Almost all life on Earth goes extinct. You sit in the mouth of your cave and look out at the once smoldering, now freezing world created by World War III. Some humans who reached fallout shelters will survive longer than you. It will be years before all the soot and dust particles descend from the atmosphere. It will be decades before the radiation from nuclear fallout decreases to livable levels. It will be centuries before life is able to bounce back from the devastation World War III has caused to this planet Earth. And it will be millennia before the climate and ecosystems in heavily hit areas return to stability. You will not survive World War III. If you are able to make it through a nuclear attack without being incinerated in the initial blast, avoid being poisoned by the radioactive fallout, or getting killed by collateral damage, then you will be one of the lucky few. But like most life on the planet, you will not be able to survive the nuclear winter that follows World War III. There will be no winners in this type of war. On a positive note, life on Earth will eventually bounce back. Humans are currently messing up the planet in many ways, and someday we might be our own demise. But planet Earth will carry on. Thousands of years after the end of World War III, when nuclear winter has subsided and the climate patterns become stable under new norms, life will evolve to thrive in a post-human, post-World War III world. Who knows what life will be capable of after World War III eliminates all humans on the planet. It's too bad you won't be around to see it. World War III has broken out. The most powerful countries on the planet are launching missiles at one another and sending invasion forces across the globe. It's only a matter of time until you get caught up in the whole thing. All you want at this point is a safe place to lie low and wait for the whole thing to blow over. Should you go to an island nation, in the tropics, or a country at the bottom of the world? Maybe there's an even safer place that you didn't even know existed. Let's find out which safe haven is right for you. It's impossible to tell who exactly will instigate World War III, but we have some pretty good ideas. The most likely scenario would start with one country invading another. This would cause the allies of the country being invaded to come to their aid. Slowly, more and more nations would get pulled into the conflict. At some point, this confrontation would reach critical mass, and an all-out world war would commence. The sides are pretty easy to predict for World War III as they probably would follow the current geopolitical climate. One side would consist of the United States, the European Union, and the rest of NATO, while the other side would be made up of Russia, China, North Korea, and their allies. There would probably be some wild cards that we can't predict, but one thing is for sure. World War III would be a true world war. What we mean by this is that very few people would be able to escape the carnage. Unlike the previous world wars, humans now have the ability to fight one another over long distances using aircraft, long-range missiles, and space warfare. Very few regions of the planet would be untouched by the events of World War III. However, this does not mean there aren't any safe places to run to. In fact, a few countries would provide safety and peace of mind as the world falls apart around you. If you're looking for a safe country to escape to during World War III, some of your best options are tropical islands. This may sound too good to be true, but hear us out. The good thing about islands in the Pacific Ocean is that they are really far away from each other and the mainland. The Pacific Ocean is a vast place, and if you don't mind warm climates, catching your own fish dinners, and white sand beaches, Fiji would not be a bad place to wait out World War III. This island nation sits in the southwestern part of the Pacific Ocean. The closest continent is Australia, which is still over 1,700 miles away. And the great thing about this is that during World War III, Australia probably won't be hotly contested over, which just adds to the allure of escaping to Fiji. Even if the fighting eventually reached the Australian continent, you would be so far away that you probably wouldn't even notice. Fiji itself doesn't have much to offer in terms of wartime strategy or resources. It has a very small military of around 6,000 individuals, so it would not be seen as a threat by either side. But perhaps one of the best things Fiji has going for it in terms of remaining safe during World War III is that it doesn't have many natural resources within its borders. Beautiful beaches and an abundance of seafood tend not to be what the world's superpowers are after while at war. This means Fiji would likely not be a target, making it one of the safest countries you can move to if World War III ever broke out. While the world descended into chaos, you could be sipping pina coladas on a white sand beach with a fishing pole in the water. Or better yet, 
you could be drinking the national beverage of Fiji called kava, which is made of the crushed root of the yangona, which has been shown to have medicinal properties. This is another thing that would make Fiji such a good nation to hide away in if World War III happened. Although it doesn't have strategic significance, it does have an endless supply of food, fertile lands to grow crops, and plenty of ways to keep yourself busy. In fact, there are around 300 islands that make up the country of Fiji, so if you didn't get along with your neighbors, you could just load up your boat and cruise to a different island. The only problem is that you'd be so far removed from the fighting that you might not know who was winning or even when the war came to an end until long after it was all over. During a world war, global communication would probably go down as satellites are targeted by each side to disrupt enemy transmissions. This would mean the only way to receive news would be by word of mouth. Like in the olden days, before the internet or telephones, you'd have to wait until someone physically came to the island and informed you about what was going on across the ocean. Then again, if you're trying to escape World War III, you probably don't mind not being up to date on wartime news, so this wouldn't be a deal breaker. If Fiji isn't isolated enough for you, there is another island nation in the Pacific that could be even more appealing to hide on during World War III. Tuvalu is a 10 square mile island chain just over 1,000 miles north of Fiji, making it even further from mainland. There are only around 11,000 people on the islands of Tuvalu, and its remote location and lack of natural resources make it an undesirable target for either side during World War III. If you did seek refuge in Tuvalu, it's likely you wouldn't see anyone new for the duration of your time in the island nation. Tuvalu is hard to get to in the best of times, so the two airlines that fly to the country probably won't be doing so at all with a world war going on. This means that the only other way to access the country is by boat. It's unlikely that one of the sides in World War III would divert resources to Tuvalu as it serves no strategic significance, but like Fiji, there is plenty of food and resources that can be gathered from the ocean to help sustain you throughout the war. There's another island country that is much larger than Fiji and Tuvalu, and although it's a little closer to the mainland, it would still provide safety during World War III. New Zealand is a beautiful nation that seems to have plenty of every type of environment crammed into a single island. If you're looking for a safe place to hide from the carnage of World War III and still want seasons and ecological diversity, New Zealand is the country for you. The country itself is a little over a thousand miles from Australia, but it sits further south in both Fiji and Tuvalu, meaning that New Zealand could potentially be further away from the main front of World War III, which we would expect to happen in Europe, Asia, and in the North American continent. However, there are many more natural resources in New Zealand than in most other island nations. This would be beneficial if you sought refuge there during World War III, but it could also make the nation a target for invasion. However, due to where it's located, this seems highly unlikely. There also isn't really much strategic significance to invading the country. The nation itself has fertile lands, abundant marine resources, and various landscapes that would provide protection even if the war did reach the island. Around 30% of New Zealand is protected land, which means there are plenty of areas where resources can be gathered, and where you could hide away if needed. It may sound crazy, but there is another abundant resource on the island that would help you ride out World War III. For every person in New Zealand, there are 10 sheep. This means you have plenty of wool to make clothes and a source of protein if times get hard. The sheep also help fertilize the land and can provide milk as well, meaning that these useful creatures will be your best friends as you safely wait for the war to come to an end. There are many benefits to living in New Zealand even when the world is not at war, but perhaps what would make this nation the ideal location to move to is that its infrastructure is highly developed and the country has been working on becoming self-sufficient for decades. It's because of the steps that the government has taken in recent years to ensure the country remains a safe, comfortable place to live that New Zealand consistently is rated one of the top 10 happiest countries in the world. So if you're looking for a country that is isolated, safe, and provides an abundance of resources as well as beautiful land to live on during World War III, New Zealand has got you covered. New Zealand does its best to maintain a peaceful country which means it'll likely stay out of World War III altogether. In fact, New Zealand is only second to Iceland on the Global Peace Index, which brings us to our next safe country if a world war breaks out. Iceland is over a thousand miles from the United Kingdom and the rest of Europe. This means it's unlikely the country will be any direct danger during World War III. Like many other island nations thus far, Iceland has tons of marine resources that would allow it to remain self-sufficient if World War III ever broke out. What makes Iceland a great place to be during a global war is that the country gets 100% of its energy from renewable sources, all of which are within its borders. Iceland harnesses a massive amount of geothermal energy and converts it into electricity and heat. While war rages across the planet, Iceland would not have to worry about procuring oil, coal, or any other forms of energy from different parts of the world. Being totally self-sufficient means Iceland could stay out of the conflict and focus on keeping the people inside its borders safe. Some parts of Iceland can be pretty arid and harsh, but there is abundant fresh water and seafood. 
If you made your way into the mountains of Iceland, you would be isolated and protected from the rest of the world. There are fewer resources in this region, but it's incredibly doubtful you would ever encounter a military force while living there. However, the best place to be in Iceland during World War III would be along the coast, so you could take advantage of the plentiful fisheries and aquatic resources. As long as you don't mind eating seafood every day, you would have a full belly for the duration of the war. There is plenty of land to settle down on in Iceland if you need to find a place to wait out the war. In fact, the current population puts an average of 8 people per square mile in the country. This means there is plenty of space for refugees of World War III if they decide to relocate to Iceland. If you plan ahead, you could even find a nice piece of land in a small Icelandic fishing village that's self-sufficient and safe to live in until the war is over. You might even decide to stay after it's safe to return home. There is one downside to Iceland, however. The fact that it sits between Europe and North America might cause it to be a staging area to launch invasions across the Atlantic. This scenario is not very likely, as both sides would probably blow each other up with nukes before they would send an invasion force across the Atlantic Ocean, but you never know. Even though there is a chance that a fleet might sail by Iceland or even make a stop on their way while crossing the ocean, living in northern Iceland will all but guarantee your safety during World War III. There are other island nations that would actually be closer to the action but could still offer some safety during World War III. One such country actually started out as a military fortress during the Crusades. Malta sits just off the coast of Sicily in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. In World War III, this might be a good country to run to if your plan is to get out of Europe, but at some point Malta would be consumed by the war. Until then, it could serve as a way out of the region to provide refugees for escapees. The nation of Malta is only around 122 square miles and has limited resources. This means it wouldn't be an initial target for either side at the beginning of World War III. There are several large fortresses around the island that were built by the Hospitallers and the Knights Templar during the Crusades. These could serve as safe havens as plans were made to evacuate people to safer lands. Malta has successfully fended off invasions in the past, so it's possible that they could do it again. Maybe Malta could also be an embarkation point for people trying to make it to the Azores Islands. This remote archipelago is technically part of Portugal, which would not be a safe country to be in during World War III. But the Azores' abundance of natural resources and its remote location in the Atlantic would definitely make it a safer place to be than many other parts of the world. The Azores have plenty of farmable land and a plethora of marine resources. However, people from Portugal and the rest of Western Europe might have the same idea and head straight for the Azores Islands at the same time. This might lead to overcrowding on the archipelago, but at least it would be safe for the time being. One part of the world that's so often overlooked at the end of the world scenarios is South America. World War III will likely be fought in the Northern Hemisphere. The most probable scenario would be World War III starting in Europe or Asia. And although it's doubtful that World War III will reach North America until later on, the countries near the United States would be targets at some point. Canada is a vast country, and there'd be plenty of locations that would remain untouched by World War III due to its size and untamed wilderness. However, coastal cities and certain places along the U.S. border would be attacked as a means to invade the U.S. The same could be said about Mexico. Although there are likely regions in the highlands and jungles of the country that would remain safe, its overall proximity to the U.S. would make other parts of Mexico vulnerable to attack. However, South America is far enough away from the U.S. and any other major players in World War III that it would be an ideal place to go once the fighting broke out. The safest country in this scenario would be Chile. Chile is the southernmost country in South America. Not only that, but the city of Puerto Williams is the southernmost city in the entire world. The country itself has tons of natural resources and numerous geological features that make it an easy escape if the war ever does reach South America. Chile is one of the most developed nations in all of South America, meaning there's already infrastructure in place to sustain the country if the rest of the world is at war with each other. There are two options of where to go in Chile that would ensure your safety during World War III. The Andes Mountains stretch across the entire western part of the country, and it's in these mountains that the indigenous communities have lived for hundreds of years. There are endless amounts of fresh water and fertile land that can be terraced to grow crops. The mountains offer protection and serve as a deterrent for any enemy force that might try to occupy the country. The mountains and many other regions of Chile contain dense forests that can be used to build a cabin in the woods, and a number of wild animals that can provide sustenance in extreme circumstances. Not to mention that Chile is the fourth largest exporter of wine globally, which means while the northern hemisphere becomes a scarred battlefield of destruction and death, you could be getting tipsy off of some of the best wine in the entire world. The other option is settling as far south as possible. This next closest land from the southern tip of Chile is Antarctica. It's highly unlikely that any part of World War III would be fought in the frozen Antarctic waters. This means living in southern Chile would be pretty safe. The weather can be brutally cold, and storms often whip across the region, but the oceans are bountiful, and different varieties of potatoes grow pretty much everywhere in the country. 
And while we're talking about the extreme south, there's probably no safer place on the planet than Antarctica during World War III. You could theoretically take refuge in one of the science outposts there and wait for the fighting to end. No one's going to be coming to that Antarctica to wage the war. But the lack of resources and the inability to resupply during that time would make it important to ration resources. Eventually, you would run out of supplies and you would need to leave the continent. But if you could stay in Antarctica until peace was declared, you would be safe the entire time. There is one other southern country that is resource rich and would be an excellent place to escape to during World War III. You could even go on a safari while you're there. South Africa contains around 10% of all plant, bird, and fish species in the world. It also is home to around 6% of mammal species. This makes South Africa an ideal place to hide from the turmoil of World War III. There are plenty of food sources, freshwater supplies, and fertile coasts in the country. It also helps that South Africa is very far away from the regions of the world that would be fighting. It's conceivable that the fighting wouldn't even reach its northernmost border, let alone the rest of the country. South Africa also consists of many types of environments, but there's probably no safer city in this part of the world to be in during World War III than Cape Town. This is a thriving city with modern infrastructure and resources all around it. There's plenty of fishing off the coast and the mountains that surround the city isolated from the rest of the continent. Cape Town isn't as far south as other cities, but its location would make it strategically undesirable. Therefore, South Africa would probably be left alone during the conflict. Also, like Chile, South Africa is a large exporter of wine. Between the abundance of food, its protected location, and the availability of alcohol, South Africa would be a safe and not too unpleasant country to spend World War III in. Greenland is massive. It is also freezing. But if there's any country in the world that you could find a safe place to wait for the end of World War III in, this would be it. The tricky part would be getting to your final destination once you were within the country's borders. There are no roads between the towns of Greenland. This is a good thing in terms of finding a safe haven. The more difficult the region is to reach, the safer it'll be during wartime. For optimal security, you'd want to choose one of the more northern towns to live in, like Kanak, which sits just inside the Arctic Circle. Like with Antarctica, the war will likely never reach you at this extreme latitude. You'd have to learn the ways of the Inuit people and learn how to live off the land in a polar climate, but it would all be worth it to have a safe and secure place to live during World War III. Due to Greenland's location and size, there's little reason for either side in World War III to try to invade its lands. If the war did happen to reach the part of the country you're in, you could always hop on a boat or helicopter and head further north. At some point, you'll find a town that's far enough out of the way that no military forces would find it useful. To be fair, Greenland as a whole holds very little strategic significance, and the only World War III action it would see would be ships sailing by to invade the other side of the Atlantic Ocean, or planes flying overhead. There would likely be no forces or troops stationed in the country itself. Living in rural Greenland would be much more difficult than sipping wine in Chile or fishing off a tropical beach in Fiji. However, Greenland would provide significant protection from the carnage of World War III, while also providing the resources you need to stay alive. Depending on where you initially lived before World War III broke out, Greenland might be a more viable option for safety than some of the other countries in this video. For example, if you reside in the northeastern part of the US, Greenland would definitely be the closest safe haven to you. Just because it's cold and desolate doesn't mean you should count Greenland out in a time of war. Beggars can't be choosers. Although the countries on this list are all good options to escape to in the event that World War III breaks out, there is something that you need to remember. If you find yourself in any of the countries on this list when World War III starts, you will likely be safe as the war will pose very little threat to you. However, none of that matters if each side begins launching nukes at one another. The nuclear fallout from the blasts would be carried across the world on the planet's natural air currents. The rain falling from the sky would be poisonous as it would carry lethal doses of radiation in every drop. The nuclear explosions would incinerate anything in their vicinity, causing firestorms that would release massive amounts of smoke and ash into the atmosphere. This could plunge the planet into a nuclear winter where temperatures would plummet as the sun's light is blocked out by all the particulates in the atmosphere. At this point, it wouldn't matter if you were in Russia, the United States, or Antarctica, as there would be no escaping this global catastrophe. If this ends up being the ending of World War III, the safest place will be to not be on Earth, but in space. As the countries of the world annihilate one another and the planet using nuclear weapons, the astronauts aboard the International Space Station will look on in horror as their home is destroyed before their very eyes. For a short amount of time, they might be the last of the human species. Unfortunately, even the astronauts would run out of resources and die, and this would be the end of humanity, and it would be all because we couldn't get along with one another. So the safest thing you can do if World War III ever breaks out is to head to one of those countries from this video and hope the war comes to an end before the nukes start flying. If nuclear holocaust is the fate of the planet, then your only chance for survival is to hijack a rocket ship and head for the stars. Eventually, you'll die from lack of oxygen and resources, but at least you'll make it slightly longer than the rest of us. The alternative is to make your way to one of the countries with an abundance of wine, 
and have a drink as the world falls apart around you. The date? It's Christmas Eve 2019, and deep in the heart of Cheyenne Mountain in Colorado, technicians are working at the North American Aerospace Defense Command, otherwise known as NORAD, to track the flight of a Russian rocket launch. In accordance with international regulations, the Russian space agency Roscosmos formally announced the launch weeks before and filed a flight plan with the UN. The launch is a curious one, as the launch trajectory doesn't follow the typical equatorial or polar orbital trajectories of most spacecraft. The Russians claim that the rocket contains a probe, which will use the highly eccentric orbit to rendezvous with a medium-sized asteroid flying past the Earth a few million miles away, itself on a highly eccentric orbit. The math checks out, and thus, as NORAD tracks the launch entering space above the US, there's no reason for alarm. Nonetheless, American space and ground-based imaging assets still track the curious Russian probe. The rocket seems to be smaller than anticipated for the launching of a deep space probe, but the Russians claim that their probe is powered by an ion engine which doesn't require require much fuel. Some inside of the American aerospace and defense sector are suspicious that the launch is actually a new secret Russian military satellite, and thus NORAD is ordered to track its trajectory carefully and detect if any sub-vehicles are released from the main body of the spacecraft as it reaches orbit. The Russian spacecraft reaches a point in its orbit over the middle of the United States when suddenly the numerous electronic eyes and ears following its flight go blind all at once. At first, NORAD technicians believe that there must be some computer error within NORAD systems itself. As the command post is not receiving any data from over a dozen of the surveillance platforms it had been using. In fact, several other assets have apparently gone offline as well, including satellites and ground based communications and tracking stations. Then an icy cold chill grips the men deep inside their bunker at NORAD. A secret global surveillance network of space based sensors begin to phone home, and the news they're reporting is terrifying. This sensor system dates back to the 1970s and have only one job, monitor the entire surface of the Earth from very high orbits and detect all the telltale flash and heat of a nuclear explosion. Originally designed to help enforce the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, which prohibited the testing of nuclear weapons in the atmosphere, outer space, or underwater, this space surveillance network was left in operation to help prevent rogue states from testing weapons in remote areas of the world. Now the decades-old system is calling home, and the news is troubling. A major nuclear detonation has been detected directly over the heart of the United States. Several hundred miles above the US, a nuclear flash briefly creates a second sun and lights up the sky above much of the US. Simultaneously, the titanic electromagnetic pulse sweeps over the entire nation, burning out power and communication systems across across the entirety of the US and most of Mexico and Canada. Power transformers are blown and the electricity across most of the nation is shut down permanently. Cities go dark all across the US. Radio and satellite communications equipment across the nation is destroyed by the electromagnetic pulse, and only a few pieces of military equipment, specifically hardened against EMP pulses, survives. In space above the US, the blast destroys dozens of satellites, knocking out communication relay networks that connect the world. The EMP blast reaches further out and manages to destroy many more satellites, though luckily more modern satellites have been hardened against the effects of the sun and are shielded from the EMP blast. In the span of a few short seconds, the United States has been sent back to the industrial age. It will take weeks to restore cross-country communications and months to begin to bring back the power to major cities. It will be years, perhaps as much as a decade, before the American electrical grid is fully repaired. Millions will die in time, and yet this was just the opening shot of World War III. NORAD is itself shielded from the effects of an EMP pulse and immediately it uses an old but still reliable communications network to send emergency action messages across the country. These messages reach several important American military bases, and in moments, men and women scramble to respond to the Russian attack. Everybody knows what's next, and it's vitally important that the nation restore its ability to respond to this attack as quickly as possible. Deep in the heart of Russia, giant concrete doors are already yawning open. Klaxons and warning signals sound out across a Russian plane, broken up only by the dozens of missile silos buried deep beneath its dirt. With a fiery roar, each missile lifts up into the sky one by one. At NORAD, a surviving satellite sends a missile launch warning. The president has been warned over an emergency relay system, but communications all across the US are severely hampered by the EMP attack. Nobody, not even the president, can reach the rest of the United States' nuclear alert 
forces to order a retaliatory attack, let alone command the U.S. military at large. At Travis Air Force Base in California and Patuxent River in Maryland, flight and support crew rushed from their alert station to huge egg white painted aircraft. Ground crew rushed to complete the few preparations needed to get this aircraft into the air, and within minutes, the big plane is already lumbering down the runway. This plane carries no bombs, no missiles, no weapons of any kind, and yet, as the two aircraft on opposite sides of the country finally take to the air, they have now become the most dangerous weapons on the face of the planet. The E-6 Mercuries immediately make for a cruising altitude around 50,000 feet. Each plane is manned by two pilots and three engineers, along with a battle staff of nine. Amongst the airborne staff is a general officer, and if communications with the president or any other member of the nation's nuclear command authority can't be established, each general can assume full command of the United States' military, to include its nuclear forces. The E-6 is outfitted with a vast array of extremely powerful, jam-resistant and EMP-hardened communications gears. Antenna ring the aircraft, and in moments, it has linked up with the nation's emergency airborne command and control aircraft, a fleet of similar planes whose job is to create an airborne communications relay system across the United States and beyond. With ground-based comms down and the U.S.'s space network severely affected, this fleet of aircraft now provide a direct link communications network, relaying signals off each other and to their final destination. Shortly after the E-6s reach cruising altitude, though, news comes in of a second nuclear detonation in Washington, D.C. This was a ground-based blast, and both crews realize that the Russians have struck at the nation's capital with a small nuclear weapon that was likely smuggled into the U.S. This explosion has eliminated nearly all of the upper-level command and control structure of the U.S. government, and yet the mission of each E-6 is unaffected by the attempt to decapitate the U.S. military and government. Assuming command, the general officer aboard the E-6, currently flying a few dozen miles off the east coast of the United States, immediately re-establishes communications with the U.S.'s ground-based missile forces. Using a system of very high-frequency and super-high-frequency antennas, the E-6 is able to alert launch control officers deep in their bunkers to prepare their missiles for launch. The the communication system affords so much control over the U.S.'s land-based ICBMs that the general now in command of the United States nuclear forces is able to reprogram the targets to several of the missiles. A second command instructs the United States Air Force to immediately begin launches of its Space Resilience Program, and in minutes, converted ICBMs kept at the ready are rocketing into the sky. Shortly after, the payload fairing on each of the converted ICBMs split open, releasing a swarm of micro-satellites which have been boosted into orbit around the Earth. The micro satellites immediately re-establish the U.S.'s space communications and intelligence network, and starts feeding data directly into each E-6 Mercury currently in flight. Now the general aboard the East Coast's E-6 is finally able to communicate with U.S. military forces abroad and with America's allies. Within seconds, the world at large is aware of the attack on the United States, and NATO makes preparations for war. U.S. forces abroad prepare for the war that will immediately follow the end of the world. From the rear of each E-6, an antenna is released and then dropped to trail behind the aircraft. With 5 miles of wiring, the very low frequency antenna at the end of the wire now hangs 26,000 feet below and behind the aircraft, and immediately establishes communications with the U.S.'s submarine fleet. Emergency action messages are relayed to American ballistic missile submarines, and the captains of individual boats race to make their missiles ready for launch. It's now 15 minutes after the EMP attack, and space-based sensors along with a few surviving ground tracking stations confirm dozens of Russian nuclear warheads in their mid-course trajectories. Ballistic missile interceptors based on the west coast of the United States boost into the air, launching from their silos in Alaska, California, and Washington. Thanks to data links provided by the E-6 Mercuries, the interceptors are able to close in on Russian warheads, though unfortunately they manage a measly kill ratio that knocks only a few handful of the dozens of incoming nuclear warheads out of the sky. The next line of defense is the U.S. Navy, and with targeting data relayed by the E-6's network capabilities, American destroyers on the west coast and in the Arctic fire off a salvo of SM-3 missiles, intercepting the incoming warheads in their final trajectories. The Navy fares a little better than the Air Force's ballistic missile interceptors, and another handful of warheads are knocked out of the sky by the SM-3s. Now, the crew of each E-6 aircraft braces itself. There's nothing left to do but wait for the inevitable. Luckily, they don't have to wait long. 
A minute after the Navy's last-ditch effort to intercept the incoming warheads, the first nuclear strike rocks the west coast of the United States. Miraculously, Los Angeles suffers only a glancing blow. Some of the warheads aimed at it intercepted in flight. San Francisco and San Diego, however, are obliterated, each taking multiple direct hits. Thirty seconds later, the nuclear detonations spread east, reaching Colorado, Nevada, and Wyoming. NORAD is rocked by a near miss but survives intact. The nuclear missile fields in Montana and the Dakotas are obliterated by multiple strikes, though their own missiles have already been launched. Two minutes after the first impact, New York, Atlanta, and Philadelphia are wiped off the map. Washington, already rocked by a small ground-based nuclear weapon, is struck again for good measure. Three minutes after the first detonations, the U.S. is silent. Most of its major cities have been reduced to rubble. Over a hundred million are already dead. America's military command structure survives, however, and the crews of the in-flight E-6 watch on monitors as the first American nuclear strikes devastate Russia. The first to strike back are America's ballistic missile submarines, and their missiles devastate Russia's seaboard cities. A few minutes later, American ICBMs rain down extinction in Moscow, St. Petersburg, and Vladivostok. The first phase of World War III is over, but the war itself has only just begun. The E-6 aircraft link up with American's Airborne Emergency Communications Network and its space assets to coordinate the military response by the U.S.'s overseas forces. Many overseas American bases have been struck in the nuclear attack, but the ability to quickly restore communications afforded by the E-6s means that many other forces manage to disperse in time to avoid destruction. Now the E-6s relay orders around the globe to all surviving U.S. and NATO forces who prepare for for an assault into Russia in order to ensure that World War III does not have a follow-up nuclear exchange. With Russia hogging all the negative press lately, you might have missed Chinese President Xi Jinping's adamant proclamation that Taiwan will be reunited with the mainland. And he is not ruling out military force to accomplish this goal. But with the vast majority of Taiwanese citizens wanting nothing to do with mainland communist China and American President Joe Biden promising that the U.S. would come to Taiwan's aid, World War III is looking more likely and it won't be starting in Europe. How is China going to defeat the U.S. and its allies? And more importantly, why does Taiwan matter so much that the U.S. is willing to fight to keep it free and independent? China wants Taiwan and the U.S. wants Taiwan to remain free. Both sides have their various reasons, but there are some significant overlaps. For China, Taiwan is both a matter of national prestige and a national defense priority. The island is home to the Chinese nationalists who fled after losing the war against the communists after World War II. And given the difficulty of an invasion plus the support of the United States, reunifying this breakaway province by force has not been an option for China. It's only recently with China's vast modernization of its military and steadily expanding amphibious assault capabilities that the dream of taking over Taiwan is approaching fruition. But as long as Taiwan remains fiercely independent and refuses to bow to Beijing, China cannot be taken seriously as a global military power. After all, why should anyone fear your military when it can't even pacify an island sitting right off your own shores? For the Chinese Communist Party, Taiwan represents an existential threat, though. The nation began as a dictatorship but gradually became a liberal and open democracy. Today, it's amongst the most successful democracies in the world, and that's a big problem for the CCP. As long as Taiwan remains independent, it remains a symbol for the Chinese people of what life could be like for them if they were no longer under the thumb of the CCP. After the extreme measures enacted by President Xi during and after COVID, disillusionment with China's government and the very society it's built around has skyrocketed amongst the youth. To many of them, the democracy lurking right off their own shore is a more appealing choice, and as long as Taiwan remains independent, it'll continue singing its siren song of democracy to the Chinese people. However, there are two very real and very significant strategic reasons for China to want to take Taiwan back and for the U.S. to want it to remain independent. First is a Western strategy known as the First Island Chain. This is a chain of pro-Western friendly nations that ringed the shores of China and Russia both. During the Cold War, it acted as a physical barrier to communist navies in case of war, who would be hemmed in and unable to operate in open waters without being destroyed attempting to break to the open sea. The First Island Chain also allows friendly navies to operate very close to enemy shores by having resupply and repair facilities readily available and not relying on far-flung bases which would limit loiter time for friendly ships and aircraft. Today, the First Island Chain strategy no longer hems in the Soviet Union and its allies and instead acts as a barrier to Chinese expansionism. China has attempted to break the First Island Chain by illegally building artificial islands in the South China Sea, and while the threat they pose is significant, it still doesn't allow the Chinese Navy to break the defenses of the First Island Chain completely, and it doesn't allow them to push hostile navies far enough away that Chinese shipping can continue to keep the nation supplied with the vital petroleum and natural gas it needs. 
Another strategic reason to want reunification with Taiwan could potentially impact the entire world, though. Today, Taiwan is the world's largest manufacturer of computer chips and semiconductors, wielding such significant clout that its embargo of Russia has all but crippled the nation's ability to build modern weapons. Taiwan's contribution to the global technology market is so significant that as the Chinese threat over the island grows, the United States has passed emergency funding for computer chip manufacturing plants to be built inside of America once more. If China were to seize Taiwan, it would in effect be in control of nearly all the world's supply of advanced electronic components and be able to threaten embargoes to nations that don't tow the CCP's line. A nation would have a simple choice, have its economy crippled or do as President Xi says. So how can China achieve its goals even if it means launching World War III and come out on top? China has already prepared extensively for conflict against the superior U.S. Navy, and has done a really good job of it, too. The surface combat ships are still no match for American vessels, with China having approximately two-thirds of the total battle force missiles that the U.S. Navy has. Its air force is similarly outclassed by the U.S. Air Force, which not only outnumbers China's, but has far better capabilities in all but one department, long-range air-to-air missiles where the Chinese PL-15 enjoys a significant advantage over the American AIM-120 in terms of range. However, the U.S. is fast-tracking an upgrade called the AIM-260 Joint Advanced Tactical Missile to not just close the gap, but exceed it once more. U.S. air and naval power won't matter, though, if it can't bring all that might close to Chinese shores, which is why China has invested heavily into developing a strategy known as Anti-Access Area Denial, or A2AD. The goal is simple, keep American ships and special mission aircraft such as AWACS and tankers away from Chinese shores so the People's Liberation Navy can operate with impunity. At the core of the strategy is the People's Liberation Army Rocket Force, or PLARF. PLARF might sound like something you do after a bad burrito, but it's the gravest threat the U.S. Navy has faced since the end of the Cold War, and it might be good enough to keep the U.S. ships out of the Western Pacific for good. A ballistic missile force, this branch of the Chinese military is dedicated to China's vast stockpile of both nuclear and non-nuclear ballistic missiles. China was never subject to the Intermediate Range Force Treaty, or INF, and thus, unlike the Soviet Union and the U.S., China developed an extensive stockpile of conventional ballistic missiles. Today, China fields about 1,400 ballistic missiles alongside hundreds of cruise missiles. Most of these are older, shorter-range missiles which we could expect to see deployed against Taiwanese infrastructure. But hundreds have ranges capable of hitting U.S. bases in Japan and South Korea. A small but unknown number can even hit the all-important U.S. base in Guam. The PLARF would be critical in the opening days of World War III. Both the U.S. and China hold serious counterforce power, and the advantage would go to whoever fires first. A war between the two powers would almost certainly be a bolt-out-of-the-blue attack, an unexpected first strike using hundreds of ballistic missiles. The targets would be U.S. bases in the region, with a priority target being Guam. However, this comes with certain risk, as striking U.S. bases in Japan and South Korea would threaten dragging those two nations into the conflict. South Korea may be disinclined to join the conflict out of fear of North Korea taking advantage of the situation. In fact, for China to win, it would be in its best interest to proceed a war in the Pacific with ramped up antics from North Korea, enough to rattle South Korea without actually crossing the line over into war. Fears of North Korean aggression would be likely enough to prevent South Korea from doing anything other than voicing public support for its American allies. Japan would be a different story. The two nations are famous rivals, and there's still a lot of bad blood between China and Japan. What's more, Japan agrees with the U.S. that China presents a threat to democracies around the world. Losing a fellow democracy like Taiwan to China could represent a larger global shift toward authoritarianism. China, being the dominant regional power, is also greatly disadvantageous to Japan, whose all-important trade routes pass by close enough to China to be intercepted by its navy should Taiwan fall and the first island chain be broken. Thus, it's almost a foregone conclusion that Japan would join the war anyway, no matter what China ends up doing. The rewriting of its constitution allows the expeditionary deployment of its military, bucking the self-defense pacifist ideology of the past, and it's proof that Japan is actively preparing to send ships, troops, and planes to aid the U.S. and Taiwan. This is a serious problem for China because Japan provides a convenient staging ground for both U.S. naval and air forces. A significant number of ballistic missiles would have to be dedicated to striking Japanese air bases and harbors in order to deny both to the U.S. military. Chinese military doctrine states that the PLARF is to be used in a swift, precise, and overwhelming strike against an enemy force. This means eliminating the greatest threat to Chinese ambitions in the region, the United States Navy. It's not enough to shut down U.S. bases and airfields. America has a huge expeditionary capability and lots of friends from where they could stage ships and planes. Winning the war in the Pacific means beating the U.S. Navy black and blue. 
China is counting on the U.S.'s public aversion to military casualties to win the war the moment it starts. To achieve it, it needs to score huge losses to the U.S. at the onset of the war in terms of both men and material. That's why U.S. aircraft carrier strike groups are China's number one priority. Not only do American supercarriers threaten all Chinese naval shipping, but the loss of even a single carrier would result in the death of thousands of American sailors. This is something China hopes it can use to shock and awe the American public into not supporting a protracted war. Because China cannot win a long-term conflict against the U.S., it simply lacks the material and ability to protect its trade overseas, while it can do nothing to threaten American global trade. With U.S. carriers kept at bay with ballistic missiles and friendly airfields destroyed, China would have a week or two to achieve its objective of capturing Taiwan. However, China faces three critical problems with its war plans. The first is that any invasion of Taiwan would take weeks to coordinate. Ships would have to be restationed to nearby harbors. Hundreds of thousands of troops would have to be moved from various military districts to the eastern one in preparation of boarding. Supplies like food, water, and medicine would have to be gathered in the millions of tons and prepared for shipping across the strait. Hundreds of aircraft would have to be moved to nearby airfields. Basically, an invasion of Taiwan would be anything but a bolt out of the blue. It would be a very publicly broadcast event that would have months of warning. The United States would use this time to gather global support for either painful political and economic measures against China or to build a national military coalition like it did in Desert Storm. In an unprecedented move, European NATO partners have been sending ships to the South Pacific in the last six months. These routine patrols are meant to signal one thing to China, Europe stands with the US and against an invasion of Taiwan. Invading Taiwan would mean taking on an international coalition. And there's no ready answer to this daunting problem for China, who enjoys few meaningful alliances and zero who would support it in war against what would in effect be a global force. The second problem China faces is that though its ballistic missile force is a deadly threat to U.S. forces, it might not be able to effectively deter U.S. naval operations the way China hopes it will. Hitting a stationary airbase with a ballistic missile from thousands of miles away is relatively easy. China has reduced the circular probability of error from 100 to just 5 or 10 meters for its modern missiles. However, hitting a fast-moving warship in the middle of the ocean is a different challenge altogether. Ballistic missiles and other standoff weapons need good tracking data to hit a moving target. This means that a ship must be first discovered, properly identified, and then finally fixed. China has greatly improved both its ground-based and satellite-based long-range radar capabilities, but this type of radar can only tell you a ship is out there with an approximate distance. Accuracy of satellites, however, is greater, though they provide only a temporary track as they orbit the Earth. In order to properly identify and then provide a good track, you need a much better sensor technology and it's unknown if China can foot the bill there. A vast investment in drones and AWACS aircraft means that China potentially has the tools to get the job done, but these airborne assets have to face the threat of the most capable air force in the world. China does enjoy an advantage here because the US would have to operate aircraft at extremely long ranges. But a decided uptick in both the purchase of air and sea drones by the U.S. military, as well as a new tanker drone, means that the reach of America's weapons is being steadily and greatly increased. Even if China can overcome the difficulties in hitting moving targets, there's still one Achilles heel it has no solution for, neither today nor in the projected future. China depends on overseas trade for the majority of its oil and natural gas imports. It does have two land-based connections to Russia, but one of these, the pipeline from Sakhalin, would make an easy target for a cruise missile strike via submarine. That would leave only one inflow of oil and natural gas in the far west out of U.S. reach. This would basically be a trickle compared to China's current fossil fuel supply, and within weeks the nation would run out of oil altogether. Its military could fight on for a few months at most due to the strategic reserves, but its economy would come crashing to a halt as the civilian sector becomes energy starved. To add insult to injury, over 60% of Chinese trade comes via the ocean. Except it wouldn't in case of war, thanks to the U.S. Navy. Even if its ballistic missile forces are effective at keeping the U.S. Navy at bay, ballistic missiles can't stop the huge U.S. attack submarine fleet. Surface task forces could also easily choke off China at multiple traffic choke points for maritime trade, including the Malacca Straits, the Gulf of Oman, and the Panama Canal. China is attempting to secure ports and airfields outside of the country so it can base forces near these strategically important waterways, but so far has only succeeded in gaining the use of a small base at Djibouti, only miles from a much bigger American base. With the bulk of the world on the U.S.'s ideological side and the vast network of friends and partners the U.S. can use to leverage pressure on anyone contemplating allowing China to build military bases on their territory, it's not predicted that China's forward-deployed military forces will grow in any significant amount.
The Chinese Navy may be the largest in the world today, but most of these ships are smaller vessels meant to act as missile boats or harass the fishing vessels and oil exploring ships of neighboring nations, not attempting to dislodge a U.S. carrier strike group from a vital trade artery. For all its planning, there's nothing China can do about this situation in the current or even long term, though it is steadily working at building a blue water navy capable of operations far from home shores. It still has a significant way to go to get there, however, and even the US remains firmly in the lead. Nuclear war. It's gonna happen, and you and everyone you know and love are going to die a horrible, terrible death including your pets. Well, maybe it's not 100% for sure that the world will go up in nuclear flames, but for some people, having a bomb shelter is as necessary as having a kitchen. And if the worst comes to pass, it'll be them who are left laughing while we burn in a radioactive wasteland. Then when the smoke clears, it'll be those prepared who rise up from their shelters to take back the world from the feral ghouls we've all become. But today, we're going to teach you how to avoid this horrible fate because today, we're taking a look at how to build a bomb shelter. First. What are just a few of the ways a 1 megaton nuclear explosion can turn your day very, very bad? Well, in the first half of a second of a nuclear detonation, anyone caught looking in the direction of the blast and within a radius of up to 3 miles, depending on the yield of the bomb, will have their eyes seared by a blinding white light, resulting in permanent blindness. Anyone outside of this radius who happens to be looking in the direction of the blast may experience everything from temporary blindness to permanent vision loss. At the same time, ultraviolet light will sear all exposed flesh, instantly causing third-degree burns. In the next nanosecond, deadly gamma rays bombard the body and slam into cells, ripping them to shreds and penetrating deeper into the body. In the next nanosecond after that, the ambient air temperature has skyrocketed to thousands of degrees though not get as hot as it will very soon get. This dramatic spike in temperature immediately combusts all clothing, flesh, and other flammable objects. At the end of the first second, a heat wave resonating outwards from the explosion point will slam into everything within a half mile to three mile radius, again depending on the yield of the bomb. With temperatures in excess of 540,032 degrees Fahrenheit, all flesh and flammable objects are immediately vaporized into atomic dust in the insane heat, and metal melts and pools along the ground. A shock wave then resonates out just behind the heat wave, crushing buildings and cars. If you're within a few miles of the blast, the shock wave can crush your chest cavity, and the superheated air shreds your lungs. Then, winds at speeds in excess of 400 miles per hour slam into anything left standing. And if you've somehow miraculously survived all the previous effects, you'll be Fusro Dodd clear across a few city blocks. A dramatic change in air pressure crushes any remaining buildings, toppling them down into any survivors. For anyone not instantly killed or within the 3 mile death radius, those up to 7 miles away can suffer second to third degree burns, ruptured organs, and shattered eardrums. The intense heat can also make breathing so difficult that many will asphyxiate. The pulse of ultraviolet light generated by the blast can also sear flesh down to the bone, resulting in the need to amputate entire limbs for those who survive. Thankfully, victims will experience no pain from this, as the burning happens so quickly that pain nerves are destroyed before they can register the pain. For anyone up to 53 miles away, the flash of the explosion and its resulting temporary blindness would leave tens of thousands of drivers blind in an instant and result in thousands of deadly accidents. All technology within a potential radius of up to hundreds of miles would be instantly rendered useless as electromagnetic radiation overloads the circuits inside and makes devices inoperable. Power grids across entire states would shut down and never be turned on again, requiring the total replacement of the complete power grid from the ground up. For weeks afterwards, radioactive fallout will pose a deadly risk for anyone within a few hundred miles of the blast site, especially if the explosion was a ground burst, which would kick up much more radioactive debris into the atmosphere. Those affected will die slow, lingering deaths as their DNA breaks down at the molecular level and infection and disease set in to eat their bodies alive. So, think you need a bomb shelter now? We thought so. Unfortunately, most people don't have the room to physically build a bomb shelter for themselves, as most people tend to live in densely populated cities where the living conditions are predominantly apartments. If this is the case for you, then all is not lost, and you can still successfully shelter in place long enough for the worst effects of a nuclear detonation to pass by. If stuck at home, you can dramatically increase your odds of survival by duct taping all of the windows, making sure that you seal any possible openings through which radioactive contaminants could leak in. 
If possible, you should head to the lowest level of an apartment building, such as a parking garage, though figuring out a way to stop the airflow in from big garage gates would be critical to survival. The deeper you can get, the better your odds of survival, though admittedly they're pretty slim as is already. But let's say you're one of the lucky ones and you have your own property and the ability to build whatever you want there, including a bomb shelter. Well, in that case, congratulations because you'll soon be one of the last of humanity's survivors, fighting to retake Earth from hordes of death claws and super mutants. If you look online, you can find a variety of websites telling you how to build a good fallout shelter, but most of those require an extensive knowledge of construction and materials as well as many thousands of dollars and specialized equipment. Today, we'll teach you how to build a fallout shelter that may be labor intensive, but even the poorest vault dweller to be can afford. We hope you've got a shovel, because you're going to be doing a lot of digging. And remember, the infographic show is purely entertainment. First, you want to identify a suitable location for your fallout shelter. You ideally want to find somewhere semi-remote, but that you can realistically get to in time to save yourself from a nuclear bomb. With a 30-minute flight path from Russia to the US, you want to plan on having no more than 15 minutes travel distance from where you live to your shelter. But you also want to make sure there's no underground pipes or wires where you plan on building your shelter. Digging into one of these by accident can result in you getting drenched by fresh sewage, getting the electric shock of your life, or with a very hefty fine from your local city government. You need to call ahead to your town hall or local utility and inquire on the location of any underground infrastructure before you start digging to save you the pain and worries later. Now that you've chosen your spot, you're going to want to start digging downward at a fairly steep angle until you reach a depth of at least 12 to 15 feet. This is going to be your primary entry point into your shelter, though you'll end up building two. Next, you want to start digging straight ahead for approximately 3 to 4 feet, and then angle sharply up for another 3 to 4 feet. The end result will be an entry shaft that plunges down into the earth, levels off for a few feet, and then begins to rise up for a few feet again. The point of this is simple. Without expensive entryway materials and technology, you're going to have to rely on the same techniques that the Viet Cong used in Vietnam to protect your home under the ground from blast waves and water leaking in from the outside. Unlike in Vietnam though, the water that does leak down into your shelter will be radioactive, and so you want to create an area where the water can pool and soak into the ground without ever flooding your living space, hint the slope upwards. Your upward shaft should stop at a total depth of about 10 feet though, and this is because you'll need at minimum 3 feet of solid earth between you and the bomb above to protect you from the burst of gamma radiation, so at a depth of 10 feet, you'll be able to carve out a comfortable 7 foot ceiling shelter and maintain adequate overhead protection. You're not quite ready to start digging your living area though, as you have another major hazard to worry about in the aftermath of a nuclear explosion, and that's radioactive particles being carried by the wind. In order to protect yourself, you'll once more take inspiration from the Viet Cong, who built their tunnels to protect from napalm and a gas attack by American troops. At a depth of 10 feet, you'll want to dig straight a few feet, and then make a very sharp right turn, dig straight a few feet more, and make a very sharp left turn dig ahead a few feet and make another sharp left turn, and you've essentially made a U-bend in your tunnel. As wind from the outside rushes down into your shelter, the bend will severely weaken the strength of the blowing wind and help deposit the heavier radioactive dust and other particles on the floor before they reach you. To be safe though, you're going to repeat this construction one more time. So in total your entry shaft should have two U-bends in it made up of very sharp right and left turns. Once those are complete, congratulations because you're finally ready to start building your actual living area. Although we warn you it's not going to be a palace. You'll want to make sure your shelter is as small as possible in order to keep it strong enough to withstand the initial blast, but you'll need at least 20 square feet per person who plans to inhabit the shelter for their personal needs and supplies. If you're handy, you can craft beds for everyone to occupy, but piles of blankets can make do in a pinch. You'll also want to make sure you have a toilet area, which is easily accessible and can store a few weeks worth of waste. An underground poop closet, if you will. The toilet should either be a shaft a few feet deep or a hole lined with plastic which can be sealed up and stored away until it can be safely disposed of later. It's not going to smell very nice in there, but better to breathe in your best friend's poop fumes than radioactive wind. Congratulations, you've built yourself a fallout shelter on a budget, which will give you a better than zero chance of survival. To top it off, you want to make sure you store at least three weeks worth of food and water, 
as this is when the danger of radioactive fallout is at its greatest. After this initial period, it should be safe enough to exit your shelter as long as you keep your skin covered and wear a breathing device. Most military surplus stores sell gas masks which are more than adequate at keeping out fine dust and other particles. You'll also want to line the entry point to the underground living area with many heavy blankets, creating layers of protection against any remaining wind that makes it past your double U-bands. You may not be living in luxury, nor living in the most secure bomb shelter ever made, but in your tiny self-made shelter, you'll have a far better chance of survival than us non-mole people too proud to dig for our lives. Then again, though, as with any fallout shelter owner, you really have to ask yourself one question. Is it worth surviving a global thermonuclear war? With climate change turning the earth into a giant snowball for at least a few decades and disease and starvation rampant, your odds of survival even after the bombs fall are nearly nil if the world decides to go all in on nuclear destruction. And that's before the global radiation superstorms that will poison every square inch of land and water on the planet. In our humble opinion, if the US and Russia decide to let loose with their hundreds of high-yield nuclear weapons, it's probably just best to step outside and perhaps call a few loved ones on your cell phone before it and you are atomic dust. You can reflect on the fact that, from our observations of the universe, intelligent life is astonishingly rare, if not impossible, outside of Earth, and as the bombs scream down around you, you can laugh at the fact that we dodged gamma ray bursts, asteroid impacts, and all matter of interstellar phenomenon to beat the odds, but couldn't survive each other. So stop worrying and learn to love the bomb. It was a moment in time that almost ended it all for the human race, the ultimate game of brinksmanship. This is the story of the Cuban Missile Crisis. 1962, Cuba. The Soviet Union has been welcomed with open arms by the Fidel Castro regime. Seen as a guarantor of Cuban independence from the United States, the Cuban-Soviet alliance is vital for Castro and a strategic coup for the Soviet Union. With Miami only 80 miles away, Cuba gives the Soviets air bases and naval facilities from which to do something no foreign power has been able to do in over 150 years, threaten the American homeland. But Nikita Khrushchev, premier of the Soviet Union, has not taken full advantage of the strategic importance offered by Cuba, much to Castro's chagrin. Khrushchev knows two things. First, the Soviet Navy is unlikely to be able to support Soviet forces so far from their own shores if facing down the American Navy. And second, the presence of large Soviet military forces 80 miles from the US would be an extreme provocation that's unlikely to remain unanswered. This is why it comes as such a surprise to many senior Soviet leaders when Khrushchev approves a plan to station nuclear weapons in Cuba. If military forces would be a provocation, this is tantamount to a declaration of war. The plan must be carried out in complete secrecy. Khrushchev's goal is to set up several dozen nuclear-capable missiles on Cuba and then reveal their existence to American President John F. Kennedy. He'll use the presence of the missiles as leverage to gain several concessions from the US in return, chiefly the removal of American nuclear missiles in Turkey and possibly even the evacuation of West Berlin by NATO forces. If Khrushchev can catch Kennedy by surprise, Kennedy will have no choice but to agree to the demands or face down the threat of nuclear missiles capable of reaching Washington in 10 minutes or less. But American intelligence has kept an expansive spiring alive and well in Cuba. Many Cuban citizens may not have liked the Batista dictatorship supported by the US, but they like Castro and communism even less. Rumors circulate about a large influx of Soviet military personnel disguised as agriculture experts and civil engineers. Movement of Soviet equipment across the island has been spotted and reported to American field agents who relay the information back to their handlers on the mainland. The intelligence community is convinced there are Soviet nuclear weapons in Cuba, but nobody else believes them. They must gather evidence. On October 14, 1962, a U-2 spy plane is piloted by Major Richard Heiser and takes off from an airfield in Florida and heads for Cuba. Flying at extreme heights, the plane is difficult to target with ground-based weapons, and Cuban radar operators aren't as alert as they should be. The plane takes thousands of photographs of suspected Soviet military sites on the island before returning home. The film roll, over three miles in length, is rushed to be analyzed by intelligence specialists. The specialists have been cooperating with experts in Soviet nuclear missile sites and, with their knowledge, confirm the presence of several sites on Cuba which look exactly like known nuclear sites in the USSR. The greatest existential threat the United States has ever faced has just been confirmed. As the news is rushed to President Kennedy, the Soviets continue their work. They cover their launchers with camouflage netting during the day and work strictly at night to avoid detection. Khrushchev monitors their progress carefully, 
If the missiles can remain undetected in just over a week, they'll be active, and he'll have achieved the greatest strategic victory in Russian history. October 16th, President John F. Kennedy has called an immediate meeting of XCOM, a team of his most senior advisors and Pentagon officials. The photos are analyzed and scrutinized. American intelligence confirms the locations of the missiles brought to Cuba aboard Soviet freighters and carefully hidden from public view during the transit. Kennedy asks just how long it'll take for the missiles to be active. Estimates vary, but most agree it'll take just over a week. The president needs options, and he needs them fast. Air Force Chief of Staff General Curtis LeMay, the legendary World War II Bulldog Bomber Commander, has an immediate answer. Bomb the some bitches, he responds. The United States has the largest strategic bomber fleet in the world, and LeMay's Air Force can level the missile sites in a matter of hours. The other military advisors in the room agree with LeMay, strongly favoring immediate military action. The U.S. Marines, supported by the Navy and Army, can have a foothold in Cuba with just a few days' prep time. The missiles, Castro, and the Soviets could all be out of the Western Hemisphere by the end of the week. Kennedy's non-military advisors are horrified, and Kennedy shares their objections. A military strike would kill thousands of Soviet personnel and risk escalating the conflict. Khrushchev would be likely to take retaliatory action in Germany, particularly against West Berlin, where 15,000 NATO forces are surrounded by over 100,000 Eastern Bloc forces. The heated argument lasts for hours, and finally Kennedy is given three options – an air attack and possible invasion of Cuba, diplomacy with Castro and Khrushchev, or a naval quarantine of the island. Kennedy immediately takes to the quarantine idea, though is careful to phrase it as a quarantine and not a blockade that would technically be considered an act of war. However, Kennedy needs more time to prepare the U.S. Navy and to consider how to execute the quarantine. Soviet ships frequently travel to the island nation, and he needs to mull the decision over. He knows the Soviets may call his bluff, and American seamen may be forced to fire on Soviet ships with unknown repercussions. To the rest of the world, the American government seems to be pursuing business as usual. Soviet intelligence is confident that the U.S. still doesn't know about the missiles, congressional elections are coming up shortly, and Kennedy goes on the campaign trail for fellow Democrats, acting as if everything is perfectly fine. Behind the scenes, though, the U.S. military is preparing for conflict. America's silent service, its fleet of submarines begin a hunt for Soviet ballistic missile subs and then shadow them. In the case of war, they'll be sunk before having a chance to fire. American journalists, however, are beginning to grow suspicious. Leaks from within the White House have led to rumors of imminent military action against Cuba. The rumors, completely unsubstantiated, then begin to hint at the presence of nuclear weapons on the island. A Washington correspondent spots a dinner meeting of senior military leadership and Cuban policy experts and presses for answers, but the men refuse to answer. One major editorial finally has enough evidence to go to press with a bombshell story about Soviet weapons in Cuba, and President Kennedy himself personally asks the editor of the paper to not publish the story. The editor agrees, giving Kennedy more time to prepare his response. Kennedy leaves the campaign trail in order to meet with senior advisors, and at a daily press briefing, reporters demand to know if rumors that the president returned to Washington to discuss a military matter of great significance are true. The White House press secretary assures the reporters that the president was simply suffering from a worsening cold. The Soviets, however, are growing suspicious that their weapons have been made by the Americans. Their fears are confirmed when, on the morning of October 22nd, the White House press secretary announces that the president will address all Americans on a matter of vital national importance that very evening. As the sun sets across America, President John F. Kennedy addresses the United States and the world over television and radio. The president confirms the presence of Soviet nuclear weapons on Cuba, as well as the assembling of Soviet strategic bombers and the creation of support airfields. He lambasts the Soviet Union for lying about the defensive nature of the military buildup on the island. Kennedy then announces a naval quarantine of the island, stating that any ships discovered to be carrying weapons will be turned back, and the quarantine will be strictly enforced. He also makes it clear that any nuclear weapons launched against any target in the Western Hemisphere will be considered an act of war against the United States itself. Thousands of miles away, Khrushchev and his cabinet pay close attention to Kennedy's speech. Khrushchev is actually greatly relieved. He had expected and had been preparing for military action. However, Kennedy's quarantine is a clear signal that he's willing to negotiate. That night, Khrushchev sends his own signal to Washington by attending the opera where an American performer is currently headlining. He meets with the American, and together they discuss peace. But the fate of the world may be out of the hands of the two men whose militaries are preparing to go to war against each other and in the hands of those very soldiers. Back in the U.S., the American Navy is steaming into position around Cuba and closing the cordon. With 20 ships already on their way from the Soviet Union, tensions are sky-high. Standing orders are to issue radio warnings to turn back, 
If any ship refuses, a single warning shot across the bow will be fired. If the ship still refuses to turn back, American ships are authorized to fire in order to disable the ship. Still several hundred miles out, the Soviet ships, however, are not showing any signs of stopping or turning around, further ratcheting tensions. The American secret SOSIS underwater surveillance program confirms the presence of Soviet submarines moving into the Caribbean. Back in Washington, an American reporter is getting a drink at a bar and chatting with a friend. He remarks that he's soon to be attached to a marine landing force. The bartender overhears the chatter and moves down the bar to where a Soviet reporter is drinking. The bartender taunts the Soviet, telling him that soon the US will be invading Cuba. The Soviet is not just a prominent reporter, though, he's a KGB agent. The next day, the Soviet ambassador meets with the American reporter and, over dinner, attempts to pump him for information about a possible invasion of Cuba. The reporter simply warns the ambassador not to underestimate the resolve of the U.S. October 25th, the Eastern Caribbean. Soviet freighters full of arms are approaching the quarantine zone. They've ignored all warnings to turn back. American ships sound battle stations, but at the last minute, the ships suddenly change course and sail back for Europe. The oil tanker Bucharest, however, refuses to turn back. American captains are under orders not to fire without express authorization from the president himself. Kennedy is informed of the tanker's refusal. His advisors warn him that if they allow the tanker through, it'll only encourage other Soviet ships to break the quarantine as well. Kennedy decides to risk it and allows the tanker to dock in Cuba. The next day, Fidel Castro sends a letter to Khrushchev imploring him to launch a nuclear first strike against the US. He's willing to sacrifice his island and his people for the cause of global revolution if it means the US will also burn in flames. Khrushchev ignores the letter and writes one of his own to Kennedy, penning a strong emotional appeal for both sides to find a peaceful resolution and not doom the world to the catastrophe of thermonuclear war. Kennedy receives the letter and considers it. It poses great political risk for both sides. If the letter is leaked, Khrushchev could appear weak to the Soviet people and his allies. If Kennedy takes the letter at face value and it turns out to be nothing more than a manipulative ploy, Kennedy could appear extremely naive. Back in Cuba, the Americans are now keeping tabs on the progress of the missile buildup with the use of U-2 spy planes. The planes are detected by Cuban radar, but the anti-air missiles are under the command of Soviet units. Soviet forces are under strict orders not to fire without Kremlin authorization. October 27. High in the sky over Cuba, an American U-2 is flying a reconnaissance mission. Major Rudolf Anderson has been detected and tracked by Cuban radar. Soviet missiles have a good lock on the American plane. Inexplicably, the Soviet ground commander gives the order to fire. A telephone pole-sized missile streaks up to the sky. In minutes, it explodes under the belly of the U-2, tearing it into pieces. Shrapnel from the explosion rips through the cockpit, fatally wounding Major Anderson. The first shot of World War III may have just been fired. Unknown to the Soviets, the White House had already decided even before the U-2 took flight that if it was shot down, they wouldn't even meet. A military response would be immediately launched. What the Americans don't know, however, is that Soviet strategic nuclear weapons are already operational and more than capable of annihilating an American invasion force. Luckily for the world, the White House goes back on their original plan and decides to meet and discuss the incident instead of launching a military strike. As the Americans debate their response, however, yet another provocation is about to launch global thermonuclear war. Soviet submarines have been tracked by the Americans across the Caribbean and now one has been detected loitering near the quarantine zone. Soviet Foxtrot-class submarine B-59 has been running deep and silent in order to avoid the American Navy, but its batteries are nearly exhausted. It's now loitering on the surface and running its diesel engines in order to recharge onboard batteries when the crew spot two American destroyers streaming directly at them. The captain calls for an emergency crash dive and the sub gets under the waves just a minute before the Americans arrive. The two destroyers begin dropping practice depth charges around the submarine's location. These charges are used in training and contain little explosive charge and are meant to signal to the submarine that it must surface. However, the Soviet crew don't know that the US is dropping training charges, and to make matters worse, they've been out of radio contact with Moscow for days due to their need to run deep and silent. When they surfaced, they'd been monitoring US civilian radio for signs of how the crisis was playing out. The submarines fear that the war has already broken out. Unknown to the Americans above, the B-59 is equipped with a nuclear-tipped torpedo. And believing that they're under attack and war had broken out, Captain Valentin Savitsky and political officer Ivan Semyonovich Maslenikov both approve launch of the nuclear torpedo. However, Vasily Arkhipov, commander of the submarine flotilla B-59 is a part of, does not give his consent. On any other Soviet submarine, only two officers must give consent, but with Arkhipov aboard, all three must agree. The launch is aborted. 
and the B-59 surfaces to re-establish contact with Moscow. Nuclear war is once more just barely avoided. On October 28, Khrushchev concedes to Kennedy's demands that the missiles be withdrawn. The American ambassador has already informed him that American missiles in Turkey were going to be removed anyway, but the plan couldn't be made public. Kennedy and Khrushchev have come to an agreement. The missiles in Cuba will be removed, and America will remove its own missiles from Turkey. The apparent concession by the US gives Khrushchev just enough to save face in front of the Politburo. But there still doesn't exist a direct line between Moscow and Washington, and sending a telegraph could take hours. Meanwhile, US and Soviet forces are still playing an extremely dangerous cat-and-mouse game under the Caribbean. Any minute now, yet another trigger-happy soldier could inadvertently launch the end of the world. Khrushchev orders that news of his agreement be broadcast over public radio, as that will be the fastest way to get words to the Americans and immediately stand down all forces. An official staff vehicle speeds across Moscow to reach a broadcast center before another accident triggers war. All traffic lights on the route are switched to green as the car roars through the streets, finally arriving at its destination. However, on the elevator ride up to the broadcast booth, the elevator becomes stuck. To the horror of the Kremlin staffer clutching Khrushchev's letter to Kennedy, the elevator may take hours to be repaired. In despair, he manages to force the letter through a gap in the elevator doors and into the hands of a messenger boy who holds the very fate of the world in his hands. The message is at last successfully broadcast and picked up by radios all across the world. The Cuban Missile Crisis is officially over, and the US closely monitors the removal of Soviet weapons from Cuba. Eight months later, as promised, US missiles are removed from Turkey. Against all odds, the world has narrowly avoided nuclear catastrophe. In the hunt for Red October, a 1990 film based off a 1984 book by the same name, the entire Soviet fleet mobilizes to hunt down a renegade submarine on the way to defect to the United States. In command of the most advanced submarine in the world and armed with a stealth electromagnetic drive that made it invisible to sonar, Soviet Captain Marco Ramius sets course for America with the Soviet fleet hot in pursuit. What follows is a tense standoff between the Soviet and American fleets, as the US suspects the incoming Soviet fleet may be the spearhead of a surprise attack in what will become World War III. The hunt for Red October may have been a spy and political thriller based on fantasy, but unbeknownst to the West, an eerily similar situation played out behind the Iron Curtain of the Soviet Union just nine years before the release of the novel. On November 9, 1975, while the Soviet Union celebrated the 58th anniversary of the Russian Revolution, a plot was being set in motion that nearly drove the world to the brink of World War III. That day, the Soviet state-of-the-art destroyer Starosevoy docked in the port city of Riga, capital of the Latvian Soviet Socialist Republic. The ship had been open to public tours all day, and now with the evening festivities in full swing, half of its crew had been excused for shore leave in order to join the celebrations. Left aboard the ship was the ship's Zampolit, or political officer. Captain 3rd rank Valery Mikhailovich Sablin. As the ship's political officer, Sablin was second only to the captain himself, and his responsibilities were to see the general welfare of the crew, as well as overseeing their political education. This made Sablin well liked by most of the crew. When they had problems back home, he was the man they went to see, and because his chain of command was completely outside of that of the regular Soviet navies, there was little fear of repercussions if they brought private complaints to him. His position gave him regular access to the crew, while most of the rest of the Soviet officers maintained a distance from the regular enlisted men. This not only made Sablin popular, but gave him a great deal of influence amongst the crew. And as the ship's official political officer, he was largely in charge of shaping the political ideology of each and every man aboard the Starosevoy. The son of a Soviet colonel, Sablin had grown up in the Soviet upper class, a concept which Soviet-style communism was supposed to do away with. But Stalin's implementation of true communism had always fallen well short of the mark. Yet despite his privileged upbringing, Sablin displayed a genuine care for the rest of the crew, which was mostly made up of conscripts from poor farming villages or the lower class living in the cities. These were exactly the people that Soviet policies had exploited and oppressed, Stalin having completely perverted Lenin's original dream of a classless society built on equality. Now most of them were forced to serve military terms in the Soviet military, where they received little pay, poor food, and terrible accommodations. Yet unlike most political officers, Sablin spit the twenty weekly mandatory political lessons the crew were forced to endure actually listening to the men. When they brought up complaints, instead of towing the party line and parroting propaganda, Sablin agreed with the men. This made him well-liked and trusted by the majority of the crew, to the point that they would bring deeply personal problems to him directly, such as conflicts with other crew members or troubles back home with a girlfriend, wife, or parents. 
While the Starosovoy was a state-of-the-art destroyer with impressive anti-air and anti-submarine capabilities, its crew performed less impressively than its equipment. An article in the Soviet military newspaper Krasnaya Zvezda had been critical of the Starosovoy, naming it in an article that claimed its crew was poorly disciplined. It also said that many comrades were lapsing on the ethical front and taking up liberal positions in the fight for purity of the heart. It went on to name several officers, to include Sablin, as being unable to explain why the ship's crew suffered so many problems and ended with a call for the ship to do better and for its crew to carry their party cards next to their hearts. What all this meant in non-propaganda terms was that the ship suffered from serious morale problems, and while its weapons and other systems were cutting edge and highly sophisticated, its crew was treated poorly and thus performed just as poorly. Meanwhile, it was Sablin's job to try to keep up morale while educating the men on the virtues of Soviet-style communism. On that November 9, 1975, the many problems of the Starosovoy would come to light as political officer Sablin held a secret meeting with the remaining crew. The system had failed them, he said. Corrupt party officials had used their power to enrich themselves, and the grand revolution of so many years ago had all been for naught. The Tsars may have been overthrown, but dictators had taken their place, and Lenin's dream of equality had been corrupted. But today they could act to set things right. They could take advantage of the patriotic zeal spurred on by the Revolution Day celebrations and broadcast a message to the people directly calling them to rise up against the corrupt government that oppressed them. Sablin proposed that the crew mutiny and seize the ship, sailing it out of the Bay of Riga to Leningrad through the Neva River, where they would moor alongside the museum ship Aurora, which was a symbol of the Russian Revolution. There, just outside of Leningrad, Sablin would broadcast a revolutionary message directly to the people, saying publicly what he believed the Soviet people were too afraid to say themselves. Socialism and the motherland were in danger, threatened by corrupt party officials who sought only to enrich themselves. The plan was risky. The moment the Soviet Navy detected the Starosovoy leaving Soviet waters, it would fear that the ship was trying to defect to the west and give chase. It might even attack the ship directly, and if the crew were caught, they would no doubt be imprisoned and likely executed. Sablin then proposed a vote amongst the senior officials left on the ship, with eight officers in favor and seven against it. The seven who were against the mutiny were locked in a compartment below the deck, and the captain was lured to a separate compartment by Sablin claiming that drunk officers needed to be disciplined, only to be locked in as well. The remaining crew needed to be won over now, and with a fiery speech he won the crew's support, exciting them with the talk of revolution and a future full of new possibilities. Any who did not wish to join in the revolution were locked away without violence, but unbeknownst to Sablin and the rest of the crew, one of the officers who had voted in favor of the mutiny had secretly snuck away. He ran across the docks to a guard post and warned the soldier there that the crew of the Starosovoy was planning to mutiny and sail the ship out of port, but the soldier on duty refused to believe the officer, believing him to be drunk from the festivities. Though the original plan had called for the Starosovoy to set sail in the morning with the rest of the fleet and then break away once in international waters, the discovery of the missing officer forced Sablin to act. Fearing that they would be imminently discovered, Sablin ordered the ship to set sail under the cover of darkness, and within minutes the 3,500-ton ship had slipped out of port. As the ship reached the mouth of the Dalgava River at 3 a.m., another sailor who was secretly opposed to the mutiny jumped overboard. Swimming to the far shore in icy cold water, the sailor managed to pull himself up onto the beach and run to a nearby road. There he tried to flag down passing cars, but none of them stopped, assuming yet another drunken sailor who had over-celebrated the holiday. Finally making his way to a public phone, the sailor called the duty officer at the Bulgaria naval base in Riga and informed him that he had something very important to say, but he could not do it over an unsecure line. The sailor requested a car be sent immediately to pick him up, but the officer on the other end of the line feared get another drunken sailor pulling a prank, and thus refused. The sailor then had to walk back to the naval headquarters on foot, giving the Strosovoy a two-hour head start. Even when the sailor arrived to report in person, however, he was greeted with disbelief. Skeptical officers attempted to contact the Starosovoy via radio but received no response. Rear Admiral I. I. Varenkin, commander of the Rigar Naval Station, was also skeptical of the claims of mutiny, and no contact with Moscow was made until another sailor aboard the Starosovoy sent out a message on the emergency frequency saying mutiny on board the Starosovoy. 
boy, we are heading for open sea. The message sent the Soviet Naval Command into chaos, with senior officers trying to ascertain the veracity of the message and draw up contingency plans for the recovery of the vessel. Every minute they wasted, the ship inched closer to international waters and to certain international embarrassment for the Soviet Union. The message, meanwhile, had been detected by the Swedish armed forces, as it had been broadcasted uncoded and in clear Russian, which prompted the Swedes to alert their own forces and closely monitor the situation. Fearing that the Starosovoy was intending to defect to the west, two recon aircraft were immediately launched from the outskirts of Riga, along with nine other surface ships, who gave chase. Yet the Starosovoy was sailing with its radar turned off, which made it very difficult to locate but put it at risk of collision with another ship in the icy fogs of the Baltic Sea. As the ship got to within a few dozen miles of Soviet territorial waters, the decision was made to turn the radar on for safety. These waters were heavily trafficked by civilian vessels, and a collision would be disastrous. The decision to turn on the radar, though, immediately alerted Soviet aircraft to the ship's location. And with the ship only 12 miles from international water, several Soviet bombers and fighter bombers bore down on it. Flying low and slow, the aircraft ordered the ship to lie dead in the water, and promised that the crew would not be punished and their crimes pardoned if they reversed course and set sail back to the Soviet Union. After it was clear that the crew was not going to change course, Soviet command gave the order to attack the ship. Better to lose a state-of-the-art destroyer and its crew than to risk international embarrassment and the possible transfer of sensitive technology to the West. Yet even with an order to attack the ship, some of the planes refused to do so, their pilots refusing to attack fellow comrades. Eventually, the planes carried out their orders save for one, whose crew turned around and returned to base, its bomb load unspent. For the planes that attacked, at first they fired shots with their heavy cannons across the bow of the ship as a warning, and the bombs were dropped in a circle around the vessel, the pilots trying to avoid damaging the ship or injuring the crew. Despite being armed with very modern anti-air defenses, Sablin gave an order that the crew were not to fire on the aircraft attacking them, as he would broach no violence against his fellow servicemen in the name of their revolution. Soviet forces, meanwhile, were in full disarray, all being carefully monitored and recorded by Swedish radio and radar operators. By now, the rest of the fleet had caught up with the Starosovoy, and the lead ship of the pursuing forces was mistaken as the Starosovoy by one of the attack aircraft, which attacked it with cannon and rocket fire. This ship would end up suffering more damage than the Starosovoy, and would have to limp back home for repairs. On board the Starosovoy, Avoid, though, the rudder had been damaged, which made steering the ship difficult. With aircraft raking the ship with rockets and cannon fire, the conspirators began to lose heart and gradually the ranks of the mutineers shrank. Eventually, Sablin agreed to surrender the ship, wishing no more violence to befall the men he had led in a bid to ignite the spark of revolution. At 0800 hours, the ship was boarded by the Soviet Marines, though control had already been restored to the formerly imprisoned captain. For his role in leading the mutiny, Sablin was court-martialed in June of 1976 and found guilty, then summarily executed on the 3rd of August 1976. His second in command during the mutiny, Alexander Shine, received an eight-year prison sentence to be served in one of the Soviet Union's infamous gulags. The rest of the crew, who had feared certain imprisonment, were released from military service. Soviet authorities, fearing that a mass incarceration would spread the story of the mutiny far and wide and possibly incite other mutinies across the military. Instead, each sailor was strictly warned to never speak of the incident again and sent home. Their service in the military over. The Swiss, meanwhile, kept the secret of the Strosovoy's mutiny for decades, initially fearful that the incoming ships and aircraft may have been the opening moves of a new world war. The ensuing drama was deemed potentially damaging to Swiss-Soviet relations, and thus all radio and radar records of the mutiny were classified secret. For decades, the world would know nothing about the attempted mutiny, and though Sablin's revolution may have failed before it ever began, the Soviet Union would collapse just two decades later. The threat of a third world war has never been higher, and if you live in any of the places on our list, we got bad news for you, because your odds of surviving are slim. Our first global hotspot for World War III is the Indian-Pakistan border. These two nations have a long-standing sibling rivalry that's seen the two nations go to war multiple times over the last 70 years. The root of the conflict comes from the liberation of India and Pakistan by Britain, and the subsequent fallout over who owns what territory. For the most part, the territory in question was Kashmir, with the newly formed Pakistan fearful that local rulers would pledge their allegiance to India. 
Thus, Pakistan initiated an offensive into Kashmir via tribal militias to attempt to take the territory before local rulers joined India. Since then, India and Pakistan have fought four official wars with numerous other smaller-scale conflicts, with Pakistan being frequently defeated by the far superior Indian military, who in recent years has turned to the use of terrorism to strike inside of India. Officially, Pakistan doesn't support any form of terrorism. Unofficially, Pakistan has been thoroughly tied to various terrorist groups and militias by both India, Britain, and the US, to name a few countries. Famously, it even helped arm and train terrorist fighters during the US occupation of Afghanistan, even providing them with shelter across their border where US troops couldn't pursue. When US forces launched joint raids inside Pakistan against terrorist strongholds, more often than not their targets were missing, having been mysteriously forewarned of a pending raid. On the 13th of December 2001, Pakistan-backed terrorist groups carried out an attack on the Indian parliament, bringing the two to the brink of war. In 2008, Pakistan-backed terrorists once more carried out a bombing and mass shooting campaign inside of India, and Pakistan mobilized its forces in anticipation of a declaration of war by India. Since then, the two sides have engaged in a series of border skirmishes, with hostilities heating up again in 2019 to 2021, leading to Indian airstrikes inside Pakistan. Pakistan shooting down an Indian plane, and artillery and rifle fire being exchanged by both sides. Now the two sides are closer to an all-out war than they've been in decades, and it could be the last war either side wages. Both nations possess nuclear weapons, with India having 160 versus Pakistan's 165. India has a no-first-use policy and will only use its weapons in retaliation to a nuclear attack against itself or its forces. Pakistan, however, does maintain a first-strike policy, though with the stipulation that it will only use nuclear weapons if it's unable to repel an invasion or if it's attacked first with nuclear weapons. While a full-blown exchange would be devastating, even a partial exchange will still lead to millions of deaths, thanks to the population density of both nations. So, where are the worst places to be in case of a war? India's strategy for defeating Pakistan involves carrying out rapid deep-strike penetrations into Pakistani territory. The objective for India's armed forces is to penetrate so deep so quickly that if Pakistan decided to use nuclear weapons, it would be forced to do so on its own soil. So anywhere along India-Pakistan border would be a death trap for civilians. Pakistan would receive the brunt of the nuclear strikes as panic-ridden Pakistani commanders turned to nuclear weapons to try to repel India's superior forces. However, the moment nuclear weapons were used against Indian forces, there's an extremely good chance that India will escalate the conflict by launching its own nuclear attacks against Pakistani military targets, including major military bases and installations. It's unlikely this first wave of attacks would target population centers as a way of attempting to prevent further escalation and rather be a tit-for-tat nuclear exchange. The problem comes if Pakistan decides that it wishes to further escalate by retaliating against these attacks, leaving it with only one option – use its limited arsenal against Indian cities. This will seal Pakistan's fate as India's own arsenal wipes out Pakistan's major population centers. Thankfully, both nations possess a very limited stockpile of nuclear arms and would not likely use all of them against each other in order to leave some left over for a future deterrent. However, even with an exchange of several dozen nuclear weapons, hundreds of millions would still die from the initial explosions and the subsequent societal collapse across the subcontinent in the weeks to follow. Massive radioactive plumes of fallout will drift into the winds east and north, even penetrating into China, and skyrocketing cancer cases across southern and central China. However, the effects of this war would be global. If both sides engaged in a nuclear exchange, the resulting smoke and debris would linger in the stratosphere for an estimated five years, according to a 2019 study. Global temperatures would drop by as much as 5 degrees Celsius and cause a global precipitation loss of up to 30 percent. This would trigger a mini ice age and make it very difficult for food to be grown around the world, especially in India, China, Southeast Asia, Indonesia, tropical South America, and Africa. Mass global starvation would follow, and the Earth's population could be slashed nearly in half, with most of the worst effects being felt in less developed nations who'd be very poorly suited for weathering the effects. But even if the conflict remained conventional, living anywhere in eastern Pakistan, where most of the fighting would take place, would be deadly. Pakistan has no hope of threatening Indian cities with conventional firepower, but India, on the other hand, could easily overwhelm Pakistani forces and drive the fighting into Pakistani cities. As neither military has a heavy investment in smart weapons, the fighting would mostly involve dumb, unguided munitions, which would result in extreme collateral damage. While India would easily weather the fighting, Pakistan would be internally devastated by picking yet another fight against its much bigger neighbor. For our next worst place to be in the case of World War III, we're remaining on the Indian subcontinent, but this time looking north. China and India have as fraught relations as India and Pakistan, and once more it all comes down to disputed borders. 
Neither side acknowledges the other's claims along the Himalayas. This has always resulted in a border stalemate that often turns violent, though in very unexpected ways. Originally, border conflicts resulted in full-blown military action on both sides, with one very brief war being fought between the two in 1962. Since then, in an attempt to temper growing hostilities, both sides eventually came to a sort of agreement. Rifles and explosives would not be used in any skirmish between the two sides' border forces. This has led to an interesting reversal back to the medieval era, as Indian and Chinese troops armed themselves with all manner of improvised clubs, maces, and even blunted spears. The two sides have taken to frequently exchanging insults and throwing rocks at one another. However, recently violent incidents, including exchanging of gunfire, have grown more frequent, and a Sino-Indian war might be on the horizon. The good news is such a conflict is unlikely to go nuclear, but the bad news is that even if it remains a conventional one, both sides will experience much suffering. Initially, there would be little impact to civilians, as most of the fighting is done along the northern border. In fact, the scale of fighting would be relatively small given the fact that the terrain is not suitable for heavy equipment, and providing close air support at such high elevation is very problematic for both sides. However, India would almost certainly attempt to infiltrate Chinese-occupied Tibet and initiate a local uprising against Chinese troops. The Tibetan people have been occupied by the Chinese since 1949, and despite a robust effort to destroy the Tibetan national identity, many in the region resent the occupation. Tibet would see brutal crackdowns by Chinese troops, especially as they control all media in the region, and there's no way for the world to hold them accountable like in Hong Kong, which has a large presence of foreign media. The real pain, though, would start when India uses its navy to shut down Chinese trade in the South Pacific, crippling China economically. Despite having a superior navy, China's navy is still not well suited for carrying out operations far from its own shores, and there would be little the country could do to prevent an Indian blockade of its trade through the Indian Ocean. Ships could reroute to avoid the Indian navy further south, but this will add time and dramatically increase shipping costs for vital necessities such as petrochemicals from the Middle East. China might be the worst place to be in case of a Sino-Indian war, as while the conflict is unlikely to have high numbers of civilian casualties, it will economically ravage China when it's most vulnerable due to the pending retirement crisis the country faces. With more old workers retiring than new workers replacing them, the Chinese economy could take a massive nosedive, undoing decades of hard work to become a global powerhouse. There is, however, one place China could start World War III and make the locals suffer greatly. Taiwan. It's an independent island nation just off the coast of China, and has been ever since the Chinese nationalists fled from the communists at the end of World War II. Today, the nation is an island fortress that's invested heavily in its defense because of one simple fact. China wants it back, and it wants it back very, very soon. President Xi Jinping has made it clear that the continued Taiwanese independence is out of the question, and yet local polls show that only a very small minority favor reunification with China. This leaves President Xi with only one choice, reunification by force. And the Chinese Navy has been preparing for just that role over a decade now, adding dozens of amphibious warfare vessels to its growing fleet. Tiny Taiwan might look completely outmatched, but has massive geographic advantages that would make an invasion extremely costly. However, it also has the support of the most powerful nation on Earth, the United States of America, with President Biden reaffirming that the U.S. is committed to the defense of the island democracy. This means that President Xi's ambitions to reunify Taiwan by force puts it on a collision course with America. The worst place to be in the case of a South Pacific World War III would be Taiwan itself, as the island nation would inevitably be overrun with Chinese troops. However, the effort to neutralize the island would take months, if not years, and the Chinese military would be forced into brutal house-to-house -house fighting inside modern high-rise cities, a logistical nightmare for any military. China, which is not known for its restraint, is likely to respond the same way Russia has in Ukraine, with indiscriminate bombing campaigns meant to destroy urban defenders and demoralize the population. Massive swaths of the island nation would be completely destroyed by the fighting, resulting in the killing of thousands and the displacement of hundreds of thousands who'd have no way of escaping the island. There is the possibility that China would allow humanitarian transport back to the mainland for Taiwanese refugees. But given China's treatment of the Uyghur people, we could expect to see these refugees rounded up and interred in prison camps for political indoctrination and retraining. But if you live in Guam or near US bases in Japan and South Korea, life would probably suck for you too.
That's thanks to the hundreds of missiles that China will expend in an effort to destroy U.S. air and naval capabilities in the region. With the world's largest rocket and missile forces, China has hundreds of ballistic missiles all aimed at major U.S. naval and air bases across the Pacific. And most of these missiles have a very large error radius, putting civilian targets near military assets at severe risk. Once more, though, living inside China is bound to suck for you in case of a war in the Pacific, because the U.S. Navy can and absolutely would blockade Chinese trade choking off 60% of its imports and most of its exports. Financially starved, the Chinese economy would tank over the coming months, with an expected GDP loss of up to 35% for the Chinese economy over the long term versus 15% for the US. The conflict wouldn't likely turn nuclear, but for our next two conflict, the use of nuclear weapons is all but certain. Next on our tour of the worst places to live in case of World War III is the Baltic states, Latvia, Estonia, and Lithuania. All three are former Soviet republics and all three are in the crosshairs of Vladimir Putin, who wished to restore the former glory of the Soviet Union. Putin's judgment is questionable, given his handling of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, but he's unlikely to declare all-out war against NATO by invading the Baltics. Instead, analysts have warned for years that Putin could try to undermine the alliance by making micro-aggressive moves into the former Soviet republics, such as, for example, seizing one or two towns or villages along the Russian border. This would, in essence, dare NATO to declare all-out war over what is, in essence, an insignificant military incursion against an alliance member. However, NATO has made it clear that it's ready and willing to fight for every single inch of NATO territory. A war over the Baltics would turn very bad very quickly for locals. Russian forces vastly outnumber NATO forces in the region, with the bastion of NATO power being located in Poland or further west. Despite the creation of a rapid reaction force and a very rapid reaction force, no NATO member realistically expects for the Baltics to be defensible against a full-scale Russian invasion. This leaves the Baltic citizens at the mercy of Russian occupiers. And as we have seen time and again in Ukraine, this means vast amounts of abuse and outright war crimes, especially as frustrated Russian troops underperform against NATO forces. Local populations would be subjected to great amounts of unguided airstrikes and artillery bombardments, with many of those actions taken against civilian targets on purpose. Rather than fighting a conventional conflict, the Russian military would instead opt to terrorize the Baltic states into surrender and rescinding their NATO membership before NATO forces can be massed in number for a counterattack and liberation. It would take the United States weeks to move the majority of its forces into Europe, and a similar amount of time for European NATO forces to gather together for significant action against Russian advances. First, they'd have to eliminate Kaliningrad to open a corridor to the Baltics, and the Russian enclave is very well fortified. Likewise, trying to push through Ukraine would see NATO forces mired down by fighting against Belarusian forces and Russian allies. While a great deal of Belarusian forces would likely either desert or outright switch sides when faced with the proposition of fighting professional Western military forces, it would still turn the march to liberate the Baltics into a month-long affair. This would leave Russian occupiers with a very long time with which to terrorize the Baltic populations in an effort to force them into submission to Russia. Images coming from Ukraine, especially of Bucha, of unarmed Ukrainian civilians with their hands tied behind their backs and shot in the head, hint at the fate of the Baltic populations that refuse to accept Russian occupation, as does the footage and photos of the aftermath of Russian bombardment of civilian evacuation routes and food aid lines. In short, Russia will commit war crimes on a daily basis until the people of the Baltics agree to Russia's terms, and NATO forces might not be able to move quickly enough to stop the civilian slaughter. A fundamentally weak military power, Russia wins by terror campaigns. But if NATO resolve held, the Western members might refuse to accept capitulation of the Baltics to Russia, no doubt led by puppet presidents installed by the Kremlin itself. The Russian invasion of Ukraine has proven that the Russian military is decaying from within, with hordes of poorly trained soldiers operating equipment that's just as poorly maintained. Despite years of propaganda good enough to fool Western analysts, it's clear for all that Russian forces are incapable of combined arms warfare, and the West would give Russia a masterclass in proper modern combat. This leaves Russia with only one option to counter superior NATO conventional power – nuclear weapons. However, doing so would immediately prompt a response by NATO nuclear members, driving further escalation up the nuclear ladder. While Russia would likely first use tactical nuclear weapons against NATO forces, it's unlikely it would simply choose to absorb the inevitable retaliatory strikes against its own military forces and installations. Putin, for one, does not seem like the type to simply accept both a conventional and nuclear defeat, and the next round of strikes would come against Western cities. In that case, being a citizen of any major Western city would likely be a bad idea. The first major escalation would probably come from nuclear strikes inside of Europe itself against industry and military targets rather than cities. This means places like the Ruhr Valley in Germany, 
would be gone in a flash of nuclear fire. Strikes against America would be very unlikely at this stage, as Russia would try not to antagonize a nuclear response from the US. However, the United States is unlikely to simply accept nuclear attacks on nations that are under its nuclear umbrella, or nations that the US has sworn to defend against nuclear attack, considering strikes against them equal strikes against the US homeland. This includes every NATO member as well as Japan, South Korea, and Australia. Strikes against these protected nations will initiate an immediate nuclear weapons response by the United States, and this makes living in any major city in the West or Russia a very bad idea. But even if the conflict didn't go nuclear, once again, even a conventional fight would spell death and destruction for a large number of people. As the Baltics are overrun and then occupied by Russian troops, they would suffer doubly when NATO forces do break through and the conventional war to retake the territories begins, with massive urban battles between both sides. NATO uses mostly precision weapons and has vast fleets of recon assets, which would severely limit collateral damage. But any urban fighting is going to cause massive loss of life and property. Displaced populations would have nowhere to go either, as the ocean hems them in on one side, Russia borders them on the other, and Kaliningrad and Belarus threatens them from the south. The only hope would be to escape to neutral Finland via boat, but we've already seen in Ukraine how Russia honors civilian evacuation corridors. With significant Russian naval presence in St. Petersburg, these ocean escape avenues would be unlikely to remain open for very long. Poland is likely to see extensive fighting as well, at least in the opening weeks of the war. But Kaliningrad and Belarus would both be turned into moonscapes after massive conventional fighting as NATO forces take on the bulk of Russian and Allied forces. Kaliningrad is a Russian military stronghold and would have to be almost leveled in order to fully neutralize it and allow NATO forces to safely operate further north, meaning the fighting here would be especially brutal. Inside Belarus, it's all but inevitable that an uprising would take place against the current president and Putin BFF Lukashenko. This would mire down pro-Russian Belarusian forces in a local insurgency even as both they and Russian forces try to repel NATO advances. If this scenario takes place after some kind of ceasefire or settlement has been reached in the current war with Ukraine, NATO would undoubtedly take the opportunity to encourage Ukraine to join the fighting by helping liberate the country. This would weaken Russian forces as they're forced to fight on multiple fronts of the war, but would once more thrust Ukraine into destructive fighting. Confronted by a much more capable force though, Russian strikes inside Ukraine would become more indiscriminate and increasingly desperate, putting civilians once more at major risk. While Eastern Europe turns into a wasteland, if you think you're safe from conventional war elsewhere in the world, think again. With Ukraine embroiled in the fighting again and Russia unable to export its wheat, the world would be thrown into a food crisis unlike its face since the Second World War. Once again, the most vulnerable would be the less developed nations. But even if you're living a comfortable life in sunny Los Angeles, you could expect to see food prices skyrocket, and many of your favorite treats disappear after a few months of fighting. Thanks to a current ban on Russian oil, it's unlikely that oil prices would be too severely affected by the fighting, especially since Russia can do little to threaten oil import trade routes in the Middle East and beyond. However, the disruption of the entire Eastern European economy would throw the world into an economic tailspin, with effects felt around the globe. Americans far from the fighting wouldn't be entirely immune to the military action either. The Port of Los Angeles is one of the most important in the world, with a significant amount of US trade coming through its one single port. This makes it a tempting target for Russian submarines who could carry out a devastating sneak attack against the port and its facilities. With the use of long-range cruise missiles, they could even threaten important rail yards well inland, crippling US trade for weeks if not months to come. Even more devastating would be the sinking of numerous large cargo vessels inside the port itself, requiring months of work to remove the sunken hulks in order to reopen the port facilities. Such an attack would likely be suicidal thanks to the US Navy beefing up security in the Pacific, but not impossible and would cause significant harm to the US economy. Even in a conventional war, no place would be safe from Russian military aggression, especially given Russia's willingness to target civilians. Instead of attempting to approach heavily defended coastal installations, Russian submarines could instead be let loose against large civilian vessels such as cruise ships, all in an effort to wage a global terror campaign with the aim of demoralizing populations against continuing to support the war. It's not inconceivable that the tactic would work either, as the loss of a few cruise ships carrying hundreds or even thousands of passengers, with many of them being American, would have many US citizens questioning why they're risking their own lives and the lives of their military for yet another European war. Once the conflict turned nuclear though, as it undoubtedly would, nowhere would be safe and the worst place to live in case of World War III would be the Earth. Now go check out what would happen after World War III, or click this other video instead.